Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Please take a seat. Please take a seat. Menu one. Good, off Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SEI Science Forum 2016. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you all with us today. This is actually the third day of SEI's discussions around the future directions of our research. And we've got a very exciting few, packed few hours ahead of us. My name is Rob Watt, I'm SEI's Director of Communications, and I'm going to say a few words of introduction uh, before I hand over to our opening speaker. I want to sort of pose a couple of questions. Why has science got a role to play when it comes to implementing the Sustainable Development Goals, and what role does an organisation like Stockholm Environment Institute have. To answer those, I'd like to take you back to what I think we might call sort of almost the, the dawn of modern science, at least modern Western science, and, and tell you about a man called Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke lived in the mid 17th century in the UK. He was a scientist, he was a, a builder of technical instruments, and he, he was one of the first people to really perfect microscopes. And he ended up drawing this image. It's a flea. But this was no ordinary flea. This was quite literally the first time that most people had ever seen something this small in so much detail. And I think that it's a, a way of illustrating why science does have such an important role to play in making sense of the world around us. He Robert Hooke came up with a wonderful quote, which is from his book, Micrographia, in which you find this flea. And he said that to be a good scientist, you need to have a sincere hand and a faithful eye. You needed to have the objectivity, the transparency and the honesty to examine and to reflect and to analyze what's around us. And certainly, I think that that's a role that science has when it comes to sustainable development goals. In a sense, what we're talking about is making the invisible visible. But there's a, we can go even further back in time, actually, uh, to this guy, uh, Aristotle. And I, I want to give you a, a quote because I, I think it's something that certainly SEI feels strongly about, that it's not enough just to know more to have more research and more facts. We actually have to be able to apply them. And I'm going to read a quote from Aristotle here. It is not the knowledge that is essential. Our aim is not to know what courage is, but to be courageous. Not to know what justice is, but to be just. It is not enough to know about sustainability, to define it, to understand its interactions. We have to live sustainably. And I think that that journey from knowledge to action is where SEI has a crucial role to play. And the Aristotle used a word called, uh, which, which is basically means the good life. 
eudaimonia. And I think that the Sustainable Development Goals are really about trying to get eudaimonia for everybody. And in doing so, that does mean taking knowledge and putting it into practice, and that's where we can certainly have a role to play. And I want to bring it back to our friend Robert Hooke, who I started talking about. Hooke Hook is most well known for Hooke's Law. It's the law of tension. This is a spring. You might not be able to see this very clearly, but this is a spring. So he, he defined the law of tension here. And our first session is going to be about interlinkages and tensions. And I think a spring is a sort of good example of that, where you can see that things are connected, but they may be actually in tension. They may be pulling against each other. They may be snapping shut. But I think the one thing that certainly SEI tries to do is then understand how we can activate those springs, <laughs> like that. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Astrid Söderbad Vidding onto the stage. Ast Astrid is the uh, Vice Chancellor of Stockholm University and a board member of SEI. Welcome, Astrid. Minister, distinguished colleagues, dear friends. It is an honor and a great pleasure for me today to have been asked to deliver this opening address at the fifth annual SEI Science Forum. As member of the board of SEI, I'm really pleased and proud of the great interest for today's event. I think it's quite impressive that the forum is fully booked. And also happy about the broad range of participants from policymakers to NGOs, from academia to media. As Vice Chancellor of Stockholm University, I'm equally proud to count SEI among our strategic partners and happy about our close collaboration. From our partly different points of view, or rather different points of departure, we share the common concern about the challenge of how to best implement the Agenda 2030 policy project, trying, uh, uh, so, sorry, the agenda. At Stockholm University, I have initiated an Agenda 2030 policy project, trying both to describe what we already do to implement the agenda and to outline the way forward across the disciplinary boundaries that are often so often supposed to create obstacles at our universities. And we are very happy to join forces with SCI in this. In today's first session, we will be focusing on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, particularly in highlighting the interlinkages between the different SDGs. In the second session, which will be further introduced by SCI Research Director Mons Nilsson, policy coherence will be put forward as one of the tools for meeting the challenge. It is important to identify where policy coherence and alignment is needed, and it is equally important to identify who does what when, which will be addressed in today's final panel discussion involving representatives from politics, policy and business. But first things first. It is a pleasure indeed to welcome Per Bolund, Minister for Financial Markets and Consumer Affairs is our keynote speaker today. We are really looking forward to your talk. The three short presentations by SCI researchers that will follow will focus on the interlinkages between SDGs. This, in turn, might mean many different things, either attractions or tensions, trade-off effects or synergies, each presentation will take a different perspective on interlinkages, climate change, land, water and energy, and sustainable lifestyles. The moderated discussion ending the first session between Director General of SIDA, Charlotte Petri Gornitska, and CEO of Scania, Henrik Henriksson, will focus on defining the challenges for implementing the SDGs. When we talk about these challenges and about how to address them, however, I think we often do so with certain specific preconceptions. I have good reasons to believe that most people tend to approach sustainability from economic, social or ecological evidence. This forum, indeed, contains plenty of research from the natural and social sciences that can be brought to bear on sustainable development. And this, of course, is of utmost importance. 
But if we are to actually achieve the sustainable development goals, I also believe that we profoundly need to rethink and reframe our ways of life. In order to do so, we need to equally engage with arts and humanities, which much too often still remains the blind spot when addressing societal challenges, completely disregarded or regarded only as a decorative detail, which may come in as an addendum to the real thing. With my own background from cinema studies and aesthetics, I can't help thinking that this is totally wrong. Language, philosophy and history, literature, film, music and art, all have bearings upon and potential intersections with the question of sustainability. Arts and humanities have a crucial role to play in order to achieve the goals. The language in which we express ourselves about sustainability does matter and does make a difference. Research on everyday use of language offers useful insights in how to avoid rhetorical traps, how to spread knowledge about the goals, how to find ways to actually achieve sustainability. Philosophical and ethical perspectives are crucial, whether we talk about decent work and economic growth, of responsible consumption and production, or of peace, justice, and strong institutions. In history as academic discipline, storytelling has become a recognized method, not least within contemporary history. And storytelling definitely plays an important role within the work on sustainable development goals. I know that not least SEI has used storytelling as a means of communicating research, which indeed is very efficient and in itself science-based. Aesthetic disciplines, just like the fine arts themselves, all address the questions of how to communicate in other ways than through official UN documents or governmental bureaucratic procedures. They have the know-how and the capacity of reaching out by other means, not least through the senses, in order both to create new knowledge and to convince, mostly individually, but sometimes also institutionally. Lenin, in his time, claimed that film was the most important art, as it had the capacity to reach out to the masses. A documentary film like Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth may, be have, may have been much contested and criticized, but nevertheless, it played a crucial role in putting the questions on the agenda for a large audience. Many advertising films for Agenda 2030 also seem to share this Leninist conviction in the different ways of addressing the SDGs through cinematography. The span of these ads is wide, from very emotional films to films rather focusing on hardcore statistics. And it's also interesting to note that sustainability today has become an issue in advertising more broadly. Large companies, for example, Volvo or H&M, have their specific agendas for sustainability, which also appear in their commercials, reaching out to millions of viewers on YouTube. But we also need a more nuanced analysis of these different expressions of how they actually work in practice. Are they efficient or can they sometimes hinder? We also need cooperative projects bridging science and art, like the Anthropocene project at the Royal Dramatic Theatre, where environmental researchers from SCI and Stockholm University, among others, have cooperated with theatre professionals to create new projects addressing environmental problems and solutions in new ways on stage, thus also reaching out to new audiences. Sometimes, arts and humanities are able to offer sharp answers, whereas at other times, also depending on the questions asked, the answers may be more interpretive, rather opening for new additional questions. But like hard science, uh, they are means of analyzing what is around us, as Rob said. But in both cases, they do provide an important lens for anybody wanting to address the SDG issue, through which to interrogate and create a sense of why we have such unsustainable trends, why they are so intractable, and how we might make a change, both individually and collectively. In addressing issues of sustainability, we need to document the present, whether we praise it or we point to its failures, and we need to analyze the results of this documentation. We also need to continue our work of imagining new futures, but based on solid scientific knowledge. 
This is, of course, already taking place. But I believe that we need to enhance the communication between different scientific areas and increase the awareness of the importance of arts and humanities in order to realize not least the 17th goal of partnerships for the goals. Why is that? Because arts and humanities are absolutely crucial if we are to change our course, reaching out for real, for sustainable development. Together with natural and social sciences and many others, I'm convinced that we will be able to make it in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Astrid, for that inspiring and opening up um, and perhaps for challenging us to think a little differently about what really matters when it comes to the, the SDGs and their implementation. I'm very proud now to, to welcome onto stage Per Borland, uh, Minister for Financial Markets and Consumer Affairs. Welcome, Minister. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Let me hand you this oh, equipment as well. The equipment. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think it's like the torch that will lead us into the Olympic Games or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much. And thank you so much for uh, allowing me the chance to, to come here and to speak to you. And it feels like a very great privilege, of course, to be speaking to such a knowledgeable audience uh, with such international uh, connections and so much information. So I will try to uh, stay out of the science and leave that to you and talk more about politics and what we can do in order to actually change the world and. Uh, make the future prospects much better for us all on an international level. Uh, I actually used to come from science uh, before I entered into politics. So I was a, a research uh, student and research, fe research fellow at Stockholm University, and uh, we were actually located together with SEI. So I feel like a, a part of the SEI family, although now in, a, a bit apart from you. But I hope I can return later when uh, my pause from academia has, has ended and I can come back to the, the real line of work that I should be <laughs> occupied with. Uh, but I feel that uh, coming from science, uh, I'm a biologist by education. I feel like I also can actually contribute with uh, some knowledge and some ideas and some new views that perhaps is also needed in politics. Uh, for example, the connection between economy and sustainability and environmental issues, which is very much part of the Agenda 2030, of course. So um, at the moment, I feel like I'm uh, in the right spot, but uh, hopefully I can also uh, come back to work, to perhaps together with SEI in the future as well. Uh, and of course, I would very much like to congratulate you on, on the uh, very important work that you do, and uh, also being a very par big part of the development that we now see on the international level. And uh, I would really like to, to extend a thank you to all of you who have been part of developing the knowledge and the, the basis for the uh, Agenda 2030. Because, of course, without science and because without the important work that you have done, none of this would have happened. We wouldn't have been where we are at the moment. We wouldn't have found the courage as politicians to actually make the decisions uh, in September if we didn't have the, the knowledge and the information that you provided us with, uh, both on the importance of moving ahead when comes to both environmental and social issues, but also giving us confidence that this is not something that will affect the economy negatively and will, will impose uh, restrictions on our economic development, rather the opposite. So that was really very, very important work that was done. Uh, so uh, of course, as you are very well aware of, uh, 2015 was an, an extraordinary year where we didn't have just one international conference, but actually three uh, international conferences, and that were all leading towards was a very much more, more hopeful future for us all, uh, starting with the, uh, uh, the International Conference on Financing for Development in Addis Ababa in the last summer, uh, where I actually was uh, leading the Swedish delegation, and where I'm very happy that we also succeeded in providing a framework where the world's countries together could see that we can together finance the development, we can make uh, the, the assets necessary to actually move forward on uh, an international sustainable development uh, ready, and we can see that we can together also uh, find the economy and the resources needed to actually start investing and start doing the taking the necessary steps. So that was really important. Of course, we've seen previously that the lack of trust between the developing world and the developed world has been an obstacle that has been very, very hard to, to come over in, in, in previous communications and previous conferences. 
systems. So I believe that that was a very, very important step leading up to the, uh, the conferences in New York and then in Paris uh, in December as well. So, um, and of course, the, the uh, Agenda 2030 that was adopted in New York in, in September was, uh, in, my, in my view, a really revolutionary uh, step forward uh, that really has changed the way that we together look at the world and the development. And we, are, we have really shown and seen that cooperation and working together in order to get a, a better and more prosperous world for us all is a much, much better way to work than trying to just get higher access for ourselves for the world's resources and that in the world that we are in at the moment with the challenges we're facing without cooperation none of us will actually uh, get to the future we want and we will all lose out so uh, in my view the uh, the agenda 2030 really uh, is what gives me great hope and also encourages me to continue working at the national and also at the international level in uh, in actually taking the steps to also not just walk the walk but talk the talk but also walk the walk and, and implement this, these strategies into Swedish legislation, for example, and also the European level. So uh, this was a really, really important uh, step forward. And you've seen this before, but uh, repetition is the mother of knowledge. So let's keep it there for a while. Uh, it's really important that we uh, learn to, to, uh, re, uh, well, to, to actually see these uh, goals all together and to also uh, find a way to communicate around them. Of course, 17 goals uh, is quite a lot, and that can make it hard to uh, have a functioning communication around this, this quite massive framework. But it's important to see that uh, all of these goals are really necessary pieces of the puzzle in order to get to the sustainable future that, that we really want. So uh, it is a comprehensive plan of action. And uh, from the Swedish government side, it's really important to say that all of these goals are necessary parts of the agreement and of the map forward. And you can't just pick one of them and say that this is more important than the other, or that this is a goal that we won't take seriously in Sweden. But we have to work with all of them at the national and at the international level. Uh, so uh, what I think is, is really also revolutionary and really changes the way we look at development on the national and international scale is that we now have a framework that combines the two uh, aspects of sustainability, or, or three if you want, uh, both the social side and the environmental side. Uh, in my view, it's previously been much too much of, of uh, different containers where parts of the scientific and political community has spoken, spoken about sustainability from a social side and other parts have spoken about it on, from the environmental side. But now we really see that these two are integrated and we can't solve one without the other. We have to work with both these sides at the same time. And the Agenda 2030 is really a very good example of how you can implement them together and see that we actually, when we work with the social sustainability, we can also strengthen the work on environmental sustainability and the other way around. So this is a really, really important step forward. Of course, another change when you compare it with the, the Millennium Goals is that this is really a, a, a homework that is for all countries of the world. Uh, the Millennium Goals were mostly directed towards developing nations. Of course, were really important uh, goals that were set up, and uh, I'm very happy that the world could uh, at least approach, and, and uh, we could reach some of the goals and work and come quite far in, in other parts of the goals. So I th think that that also set the stage for, for moving ahead with uh, truly global and an international agenda like at Agenda 2030. But this work is really for us all. No, no country can say that this doesn't affect us, we don't have our homework to do. Uh, but we also have to work at the national level in Sweden to really make this happen. Uh, it is a very, very comprehensive framework, 17 goals. And uh, if you look further in, you have 169 targets uh, around these goals. And uh, they really are an integral whole that you have to work with, with all of these uh, at the same time. Uh, and from the Swedish perspective, we've really set this very, very high on the agenda. We believe that this is one of our most important tasks that we have in the coming years and in the coming decades. And we stated already in the budget bill for 2016 that was adopted the, this fall that the government will give priority to implementing the new sustainability goals. Uh, so this is really a very, very important task. and, and uh, Many of the ministers, uh, not to say all ministers, are very, very involved in this development and take this very, very seriously from our different portfolios. 
So we all have our different uh, parts that we are, of course, especially interested in, but we also have ministers that have a, a common interest and also responsibility for the whole of the Agenda 2030. And uh, the Minister for Public Administration, uh, Adlan Shikarabi, is uh, responsible for the national implementation uh, in Sweden. And the Minister for International Development Cooperation, Isabella Levine, is, uh, is responsible for the coordination of the international level and the international implement implementation of the agenda. And we also have the Minister for Strategic Development and Nordic Cooperation, Kristina Persson, who is responsible for strategic actions and, and larger steps that will have to be taken in, with the government, but together with other actors in Sweden as well. So uh, I'm happy to say that we're moving quite fast uh, in implementing the agenda in Sweden, and I believe that we uh, have com come far uh, when you compare it to other countries, and I think that this is also very, very important because we can't just be satisfied with having signed the agreement. Uh, that's just the first minor step. It's the implementation and taking action in the real world that really makes a difference. So uh, one of the reasons why we are, are very eager and, and uh, very active in implementing the agenda in the Swedish legislation and Swedish politics is that we believe that action really speaks louder than words. We have the words, we have the targets, we have the agenda, but now we have to show that they really mean something, that we really take this seriously. And it's easy to remember that we've had international uh, conferences and agreements that uh, were very, very uh, amazing on the paper, but that actually weren't really implemented on a global scale. So this is something we have to leave behind us. Now it's really time to also make this happen. And if countries like Sweden won't show that we are ready to do what is necessary, we can't really expect others to, to do the same. So uh, we have to really take action to show that uh, we mean what we have signed around the Agenda 2030. Another reason why we take this very seriously and why we see it as a very important step is because we think that uh, the Agenda 2030 is also the recipe for our society to develop in a positive way and for our economy to blossom in the future. Just continuing with some sort of, of business as usual will not deliver uh, a sustainable and strong economy in the future. We have to work in different ways and the Agenda 2030 is really the map for us to also deliver economic means for, for the citizens of Sweden. Uh, for example, we know that reduced inequality, which is goal number 10, is a very strong driver of economic growth. Uh, we we know that from science, we know that from international actors such as the International Monetary Fund, for example. Uh, we also know that the environmental agenda uh, that really sets very high targets for us to reach, that requires of us to do massive investments uh, to move away from fossil fuel use in transport, for example, requires us to start investing in electricity charging for electric vehicles in uh, development of uh, large-scale bio biofuels plants all around Sweden and uh, of course investments in, in rail and uh, public transport infrastructure and uh, also in 100% renewable energy system which is the goal of the Swedish uh, government and of course this is a development that requires huge investments in the coming years and decades and of course these investments also are a driver of economic growth so if we want a strong economy in the future I would say that implementing the Agenda 2030 as fast and as thoroughly as possible is really a very, very good way forward. So, uh, how are we then going to work with the implementation? Well, we've started uh, running, so to speak, and have uh, already uh, made some progress when it comes to the, the strategy and, and the, the way to implement these uh, different goals and the, the Agenda 2030 as a whole. So, we've present, presented a delegation which aims to promote and to also facilitate and stimulate uh, the work of implementing the Agenda. Uh, we know that these measures cannot just be done on the government side, at the national level, we have to work both internationally with many of the uh, aspects of the agenda, but also on a very local level. So we have to get the local actors involved and, and uh, using their commitment in this, uh, in this work as well. So uh, they've started the the uh, uh, delegation has started to do start a sur survey and an assessment of the extent uh, to which Sweden uh, fulfills the goals. How far have we come so far, and what is necessary to to do in the future? What is the action plan for the implementation in Sweden? What measures need to be taken in the short term and in the long term? Um, we also uh, have given the the delegation an assignment to look at uh, the uh, best practices that is 
really available around Sweden and also internationally, where can we find the actors that have really shown that it's possible to do uh, a dif make a difference and to, to find the measures that are the most, most fruitful to actually make the agenda happen? So we believe that is, is, that's a very good way to move forward, to find the actors that have really found the solutions, found the keys. Uh, and that's also part of the, the delegation's work. Uh, and they will work both, of course, with the national and local and the international uh, implementation of the agenda. The delegation will also further anchor the agenda within Swedish society and with different actors in the Swedish society and also in cooperation on a global scale. Uh, and of course, starting a broad dialogue around this development and a discussion with, with other actors in society is a very, very important part of making the agenda happen. We know that, of course, the public sector, uh, government and the local municipalities have a very, very strong part to play. But it's also very obvious that we won't make it on our own. We have to get the business community and the civil society behind the agenda if we are to succeed with the implementation. So that is really also part of, of uh, the, the work that the delegation will do. So we have also set, of, of course, aside uh, money for the delegation, funds for them to work with. Uh, so they have both uh, uh, money for the, the salaries and the work in the delegation, but we also have set aside money for the implementation on a local level and to fund local activities and to see that it's not an economic issue. It's not the lack of funding that should be the, the bottleneck that, that stops the development. So I think that's really important as well. Um, I was part of the uh, a previous uh, approach that is similar to this, the Agenda 21. Uh, I was quite young at the moment and a young student, so I was uh, working at a very, very local level with um, well, different projects in my neighborhood. And I was really encouraged by the international decisions and the development that was coming, and I saw this was very fruitful. Uh, but we all know that the Agenda 21 really didn't deliver, it didn't really happen. And in my view, that was partly because, uh, at least in Sweden, on the national side, we didn't have the focus and the, the energy and the commitment to actually making this happen. I saw that at the local level, there was a lot of, of commitment and a lot of projects uh, being started, but there was no one there to catch all this and, and make it happen on a, a national scale. And that is a mistake that we will not repeat. We will see to it that we have a framework to really catch all these activities and connect them together and see that this provides us with a national framework for implementation and also hopefully to send strong signals to the international community that we take this uh, most seriously. So. Um, of course, the government agencies uh, will also be responsible for their different parts, and all, our, all ministers in the government will have their parts. And I would like to uh, really go into focus and look at, uh, for example, from my own perspective, uh, one of the goals that I will uh, work very hard on is, of course, goal number 12, which is on sustainable consumption and production. Since I'm the Minister of Consumer Affairs in Sweden, I see that this is a very, very important part of, of uh, making the agenda happen. So. Uh, we are uh, taking the agenda forward on a Swedish perspective by introducing a national strategy for sustainable consumption. Uh, it's easy to see that, looking for example from the climate side, uh, just measuring the, the uh, impact in Sweden and the emissions we've, uh, we emit here within our borders, we've actually managed to decrease the emissions by about a quarter and at the same time since 1990 have an economic growth of about 66%. So you could say we've decoupled emissions from economic development. But when you look at it from the consumer side, that is really another story, and we've actually increased the emission on a global scale by our consumption. So obviously we have a very, very uh, hard homework to do here in, st in order to make our consumption more sustainable from both a social and an environmental standpoint. And that's why we, we're working very, very hard with uh, um, an agenda, uh, a toolbox a strategy for sustainable consumption. We know that the consumers are really there, they're committed, they're changing their behaviors at the moment, um, buying more and more eco-labeled, uh, um, organic food, uh, also fair trade uh, products, for example. So we, our work is very much to make it easier for them to really uh, make an even stronger impact in the future. Uh, so this uh, uh, agenda, the strategy will be delivered in the budget bill for next year, which will be adopted in uh, late fall this year. So it's, we're very, very much into the work at the moment. We're working with general measures such as guidance and information. Uh, we know that if the consumers are provided with the right kind of information, the right knowledge, they really do use that in order to make a strong impact and commitment. Uh, of course, environmental labeling is one very, very good way to make the information easily 
available to make the choice easy for the consumers. We work with education, of course, if we can get these uh, um, thoughts into the, the education system and, and get the, the young generation to work with sustainable consumption, that really can make a difference both in the families and uh, how they develop their consumer behavior, but also, of course, for a long time span ahead. Uh, we're working with lifestyle issues, uh, such things as what provides us with status. Uh, we know that it's becoming, actually, at least in Sweden, a social problem that consumption is, is so heavy and our homes are being filled with all these products that we buy. And uh, actually, self-storage is one of the fastest growing economic sectors in Sweden at the moment. And that really shows that we have a problem. We have too much stuff. So, uh, for example, uh, sh the sharing economy, I think, is both a solution for, to social problems in Sweden, uh, both uh, having too much uh, stuff at home, but also uh, connecting people with each other and finding new social networks developing at a very rapid scale. And of course, also decreasing our environmental impact at the same time. And of course, the, the financial sector, we are all also financial actors and we can make a big difference by uh, making our savings work in the right direction and, and decreasing uh, the uh, fossil fuel dependence, for example. So that is also a really very important uh, aspect. So, of course, we're also working with the most important areas of, of consumption from a sustainability side. And we know that it's the uh, housing, food and transport, the, uh, uh, the car, the uh, uh, condo and the uh, cow, you could say, uh, is, uh, of course, three major areas that we have to work with. And we're trying to find ways to, uh, to actually make it easier for the um, uh, consumer to act in these areas, providing public transport and cycling. We are funding from the government side investments into sustainable infrastructure at the local level. And uh, then we demand from the local level that they have a plan how to decrease the emissions and to uh, improve uh, conditions for walking and cycling, for example, in the local municipalities. Uh, we are also working with a food strategy on the national side. How can we decrease long transportation of foods on a global scale? and start using uh, the local assets instead? Uh, how can we implement, uh, for example, encourage people to decrease their footprints by um, in well, increasing their vegetable uh, food intake instead of using, eat, eating uh, a lot of red meat that we know also have negative health effects. So that is something we're working on at the, uh, when it comes to the food sector. And also, uh, of course, the housing sector, where we both uh, are encouraging building energy efficient houses. Uh, we have a strong lack of housing, so when we build, we should build energy efficient housing, but also refurbishment and uh, well, rebuilding the buildings that we have today and making them much much more energy efficient at the same time. So that are some key aspects of the strategy for sustainable consumption. And I believe that consumption is, is also one of the very, very important areas that we have to work with in order to get the Agenda 2030 really get going and get it implemented on a national, but also on an international level. So just to give you um, a sample, an idea of how we try to work with the, the Agenda 2030, also within the portfolios of ministers such as myself. So I believe that uh, Sweden has a lot to win by moving ahead, by being the first country to really uh, start working on the Agenda 2030 and really implementing it ahead of, of the international community as a whole. And uh, the first thing we have to win is that we uh, can really set an example, showing that it's not just beneficial for the whole of the world, but also for each country uh, and the citizens in our country as well. And also, uh, of course, for the development of our own national economy and the sustainable uh, development of our society, uh, which is, of course, part of our responsibility as a government to also provide a good future for our citizens and uh, the people that actually elected us. So uh, I think that this is really a very, very important and interesting time to be in politics. And uh, I believe that we have a new world after 2015. We have a common map for the sustainable development of our planet. And of course, now our focus is very much on a rapid and thorough implementation of the Agenda 2030 into Swedish politics and legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Borland. Um, oh, yes, we have a little, uh, before I forget, a small gift to thank you for, for your, uh, your engagement wow. and your time here today. So thank you very thank much Thank you for so that. much. It's I, mean, a pleasure. I think that it's an extraordinarily ambitious 
uh, framework that we're working with, but also mm. the response of being a first mover is, is, is also presents a lot of challenges. And what we're going to move on to now is a series of presentations that I think are going to explore not only where those challenges exist, but also how we might be able to solve them, not least actually looking at sustainable lifestyles, yeah. and perhaps backing up some of the things that you've been saying with some, some solutions um, uh, that, that we'll see whether they can uh, be scaled up and implemented. Thank you very That's much. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. So I'm now going to hand over uh, my moderation role to my colleague Niall, Niall O'Connor. Welcome, Niall, to the stage. Niall is, 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 a, is a relatively new member of, uh, of, of the SCI team. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you to be exposed to some of our key stakeholders, uh, and, and they can get to know you a bit more. So uh, I leave the stage to you. Thank you very much. Um, is this microphone working? It is, yes. OK. Um, I've been kind of asked just to give a little story, uh, kind of bringing together some of the critical SDGs. So rather than going into the science and the detail, which I know the, the, the next colleagues are going to go into detail, I just said I'd give a small story uh, where I see the interlinkages. Um, we've obviously been looking at the three here, which are climate change, land, water, energy, and sustainable livelihoods. So as you said, I just took over in uh, SEI recently. Two months ago, I moved to Bangkok. Now, I was sure I knew where I was going, um, somewhere in Asia. I didn't realize it was here. Now, you might think that's a bit wrong. Geography is a little bit out. But in regards to climate change, this is where Bangkok is. It is extremely hot at the moment. We've also seen that over the last kind of um, few months, we've had the hottest April ever, which was followed by the hottest, or which followed the hottest March ever, which followed the hottest February ever. And we've seen that global climate has gone up by 1.1 degrees warmer in April now than in the period 1950 to 1980. So, Really where Bangkok is is probably just about correct. Uh, it's too hot. So what we then tried to look at is what would it take a normal day for me and how does this impact on all of these different SDGs and how do we know that they're interlinked? Well, I'll just go through one day of uh, going to work. This is the weather forecast in the morning. It's 99 degrees, which is around you know, 40 degrees centigrade. It's hot. There's an unusual wind chill factor of 124, which is even hotter. So what do we do? We have a little bit of local adaptation. We go through moles. We try to avoid going into the heat at all. So you get from the cold train into a nice mole, and it's nice and air conditioned, and you walk through that, and you try and get into your office without getting burnt. But this is unusual. The moles, if you look at them, the size of these moles are massive. The consumption of energy in these are huge. And in, there's one mole in particular in Bangkok that consumes as much power as one province in northern Bangkok. This is not sustainable. So what do they do? They build more dams. So the Mekong River now has got 20, maybe 30 dams, probably another 16 planned to produce more energy. And that's OK, we got our energy. We're solving that problem. But the problem that with that is that with ongoing climate change that's happening, we're seeing rainfall patterns change. We've had a massive drought for the last number of months there. The water levels are dropping, inefficiency in the dams. So one problem follows another. So with that, we see also the drop in the water means that there's less water for irrigation. Less water for irrigation means there's less agricultural productivity. Less agricultural productivity means there's more inf insecurity for food production. So each one is having a knock-on impact. So if we don't look at all of these SDGs together as a whole, we're going to cause a problem for another one unless we kind of stop and think a little bit. So to make it all work, um, somebody changed my slide. Uh, to make it all work, we need to make sure that we're speaking the same language. And unfortunately, there's a YouTube clip here that we can't play at the moment. But essentially, it's uh, about understanding languages. And there's an Irish fishing ship in trouble off the coast of Germany. And he's going, mayday, mayday, we need your help. We are sinking, we are sinking. And the German Coast Guard is going, what are you sinking about? <laughs> so we want to make sure that when it comes to the SDGs, we link them all together, we understand what they are, and we don't just work independently in groups. We want to bring them all together as much as possible. So going back to this, we want to try now introduce a number of very key scientists to help us to understand the linkages between some of these. Um, I don't want to kind of raise their challenges too high, but I think there is great potential for them to do so. And I have a lot of hope in them. But also just for myself, I think hope if people begin to awaken the spiritual part of themselves, that heartfelt knowledge that we are caretakers of the planet. And the scientists that are about to follow hopefully will give us clear understandings of how we bring together the SDGs, how we bring the science to play, and how we solve some of these problems. 
So without further ado, can I please call the first uh, scientist to stage, uh, Ms. Hannah Wanjuru from Kenya, who is a research associate at SEI, and Mr. Richard Klein, senior research fellow. And just to note that uh, Richard has just won recently, I think it was last week, in the was it Adaptation Futures Conference, uh, an award for outstanding contributions to adaptation science. So congratulations on that, and welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, now from uh, Stockholm City, I'm going to take you to uh, a village in the Horn of Africa. Uh, 1,000 kilometers from Nairobi, Kenya capital. That's where you find uh, Mandera County. Mandera County is one of the areas uh, hardest hit by the impacts of climate change. It's actually neighbor Somalia, so the issue about uh, insecurities um, are there. Uh, these are landscape. The people who live here depend on livestock, and they are pastoralists in nature. So the landscape uh, is quite dry, it's quite fragile. And the people who live here in the landscape are the ones who feel and understand the impacts of climate change. Uh, during the dry spell, it's a common practice that men will go out with their livestock to look for green pastures, if at all they are there. Sometimes they end up getting some very dry or brown pastures for their livestock. Then women are left at home to take care of their children, and they're also left with some of the few livestock and also, and especially the camel and also lactating animals. Camel is, very important, is a very important animal to them because it provides transport and also is a source of milk, which is a very uh, scarce commodity in this area. Back in 2013, I was involved in a study where we were doing a livelihood mapping for most of the arid areas in, in Kenya. And we found that out of the milk that they produce, uh, there were five villages that were sampled, we had sampled. Only that percent of the milk that was produced in this area got into the market. So what were the challenges in this area? First of all, there was a poor handling of this milk, by the, by, especially by the women, and also by the other people who are, who are milking the, uh, the cows. The other issue was about the marketing skill. There was inadequate marketing skill by these people who are handling the milk. The other issue is uh, in, term of, uh, in terms of infrastructure, because they had to travel a distance of about 20 to 30 kilometers just to take five or 10 liters of milk to the market. The other issue that was the problem, this area is too hot. We are talking about temperatures of around 38 to 40 degrees uh, Celsius. So the milk will go bad before they even get to the market. So what was the intervention that took place? This was an initiative that was supported by DFID UK. And these women were brought together. There were 50 women, uh, 50 women group, they were brought together. And they were trained on marketing skills, how they can even make uh, some value addition, uh, how they can have value additional skills, like even making yogurt, and bringing them together because uh, each group had about 15 to 20 members. So at least you, we, it was made sure that they can bring their milk together and not each and everyone have to travel all the way and take the, take the milk there. Uh, the other uh, initiative that, uh, the other activity that took place, these women were shown how they can uh, preserve their milk starting from a household level. So because the only resource they have, we have the firewood, so they were shown how they can boil their milk at a household level. Then at a group level, out of the 50 groups, so each, in each and every group, they were shown how they can pasteurize their milk using very uh, tr traditional local innovation. And they also provided with some of the aluminum cans so that they can be able to bring their milk together. Uh, they were also at uh, um, the, the groups when they were brought together, then they were also uh, supported with a milk shed. This is where they can go and sell their milk ju uh, during the day. It was not enough because the area was too hot. They were also provided with some uh, milk cooling uh, units. So they were provided with some refrigerators. And this one was done uh, in Mandera town. This was the, in the town, so they were able to do some, some business. So this one of the shop where they had the cooling units, and out of that initiative, at least they were able to, to sell their milk and also to, to do some value addition activities. So they were able to, to continue selling the milk during the day and sell it for a few days because it was not going bad because at least they can access energy. So this one of the, 
This is one of the small initiative. It's a decentralized in nature, how we can help the vulnerable communities gain some marketing skill so that they can be able to adopt to the effects of climate change. Uh, in Kenya, we have um, uh, in Kenya, we have the National Climate Change uh, Plan. That's uh, one of the documents we are implementing so that we can be able to, to handle the impacts of climate change. Um, since the project was done in 2013, it closed down, but now the county government of Mandera have taken up this initiative, and it's a very strong element in the livestock uh, promotion strategy of this county, and also other five counties have taken up this initiative. In this particular area where the initiative has started, we have about uh, 300 people who are benefiting from this initiative, and so far 5,000 5, women groups have uh, been trained on this. This initiative uh, uh, created links us to a number of SDGs. SDG 1.5, especially on uh, how we can help uh, people in the extreme condition, how they can be able to make them less vulnerable. Uh, SDG 2, where we look at uh, timely access to market information. Because through, tra uh, through training these women, they have a bit of market information, and they can make some money out of the milk they are selling. SDG 5, on uh, women empowerment, and also SDG 7. Because they were able to access um, energy, they have the milk cooling plant, and this is an initiative helping them to make them um, uh, less vulnerable. Uh, also, it links us to climate change, uh, SDG 13, because we are talking about how some of the um, initiatives can be linked to the, na uh, to the national strategies. Um, there we have the National Climate Change Action Plan as a national document, and we really hope uh, with SDGs coming on board, as a country we'll be able to integrate this with our, um, our national agenda, we call it our Vision 2030, and ha also how this can be integrated with the um, regional agenda. There's an agenda with the African Union, we call it Agenda 2063. So we hope with all these uh, three coming together that we'll be able to, to address the issues of climate change as a country. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a microphone. Thanks. Th thanks, Hannah. And, and you show that uh, of, of the many stresses and pressures that uh, the women in the north of Kenya are already facing, heat is one of them. And uh, the next slide is not showing uh, an optimistic picture. This is a, a fairly recent visualization of past temperatures. It looks different from what you might be used to. Rising temperatures are normally shown as a graph that, that goes upwards. This is a spiral that, that sort of a circle that spirals out of control. In the circle you've got the, the inner circle is um, the temperatures in, in the late 19th century baseline. And you can see over time, and it starts again, that it gets warmer and warmer every month. And as Niall said, the last three months, or the last seven months, in fact, were the, uh, the warmest ones globally ever recorded. Um, the 1.5 degree goal is uh, something that um, has uh, reached the um, uh, political and, and, and public imagination uh, somewhat by surprise. So for a long time, two degrees was set as the, the target uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, aim for um, in, in the climate negotiations. In, in Paris, uh, late last year, one of the many conferences that took place, the Paris Agreement does mention that it, you know, the aim is to halt the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. But it also says that we should pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. This was after a lot of pressure from uh, particularly the small developed uh, the, the small island development states and, and other least developed countries who are already facing the impacts of climate change and are realizing that two degrees is actually already making things quite dangerous for them. Um, and this was um, further substantiated in recent research in the journal Earth System Dynamics, where for a number of different sectors, uh, the researchers show that half a degree already makes a big difference when judging how different parts of the world will feel the effects of, of climate change in, in crop production, in sea level rise, in urban heat stress and, and other sectors. Now, what does that mean in terms of, of emission reductions? If we 
if, if two degrees isn't ambitious enough and we were actually to go for a 1.5 emission trajectory, that's the bottom line on this, on this slide, uh, the blue one that actually goes through the axis there. Uh, the black dots are where we are going at the moment. And if we were to follow that trajectory, the, the red line, we would end up with a global average temperature increase of around five degrees by the end of the century. Trying to, to, to bend the curve uh, to the blue one would require a major effort uh, almost immediately. The next slide shows what that would mean in terms of, of, of uh, the time that we have um, to use up the carbon budget. This is a slightly complicated slide, but it shows for a 1.5, for a 2, and a 3 degree uh, scenario, and with different likelihoods, uh, what time we have to keep going as we are going now with our emissions and then decarbonize immediately. And if we were to be 66% certain that we stick to the 1.5 degree target, we only have six, in fact, five years, because this graph is a year old, five years, and then we'll have to decarbonize completely. So that is quite a challenge. And it's, of course, not the only challenge that we are facing. Um, one of the ways that um, we could reduce emissions quite, uh, quite uh, drastically is by investing large scale in, in biofuels. And then also to, um, uh, to capture the CO2 that comes out of combustion of, of biofuels and capture that in, uh, in, in the ground. But clearly there is a conflict there between food and, and fuel as illustrated here. There are other challenges. Um, climate change is, is not the only challenge in, in many uh, urban centers around the world um, climate pollution is, or air pollution is, is, a, is a more immediate threat. And this is an article arguing that maybe we shouldn't be worried too much about climate change, but focus more on, um, on air pollution. So the question there really is, is, is it necessary to see climate change and addressing other priorities as a conflict? Are conflicts unavoidable? And this is where some of the work of SCI and, and, and of course, partners uh, comes in. Um, it's not an easy path to navigate, but maybe there is a way out by creating solutions that have multiple benefits, that address um, more than one of the sustainable development goals. I'll just give two sh uh, short examples. One is of a, a, a new project funded by the European Commission that involves SCI and a number of other partners within Europe uh, that tries to develop and apply a framework that looks at the risks not only of climate change, but also of um, fairly drastic climate action. What are the risks associated with trying to achieve a two degree or a 1.5 degree pathway? Um, I won't go into much detail, I'll just say that SCI is responsible for three case studies in this project. Uh, one in Sweden that looks at energy supply and technologies for road freight, and I understand that the CEO of Scania is here, so that's a very relevant case study there. One in Indonesia that looks at the sustainability and climate resilience of biofuels from crop waste and, and residues. And then one in, in Kenya, uh, where we're looking at geothermal energy and the sustainability of charcoal. Now, looking at, at, at these case studies, not only through a climate lens, but through a, a broader development lens, will hopefully open up opportunities to create those win-win situations. Very briefly, a final example, um, very recently, of, of how we not only through research, but also through communication, uh, try to raise awareness of the opportunity to, um, um, to create those co-benefits. Um, this is a, a recent post, uh, Johan, K1, uh, our policy director in York, and two other uh, colleagues from SCI wrote a blog that demonstrated the importance of distinguishing between the long-term climate effect as a result of CO2 and the short-term climate effect as a result of methane and other short-lived climate pollutants. Um, and it's not only about the importance of uh, avoiding warming in, in, in the short term, but also the benefits that you would get by reducing air pollution and, and limiting uh, crop losses as a result of methane and ozone production. Um, I won't go into detail here, but I just wanted to uh, demonstrate that uh, we don't necessarily have to think in terms of conflicts between climate and development. There are win-win uh, opportunities, and with partners, we'll hope to demonstrate more of those in the future. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Richard and Hannah, for that. A uh, little bit of understanding of local to global issues. Uh, without further ado, I want to keep on time with people. So can we ask uh, Jakob Granit from the Centre Director from Stockholm, along with Marissa Escobar as a senior scientist for the second presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Neil. And what we wanted to do in this session was to really look at uh, land, water and the food ecosystem <coughs> connections. And I just simply wanted to introduce a little bit of work that we've been doing with the Global Environment Facility to look at the connections between science and policy and governance uh, frameworks. Now, the starting point for this is to see how can, you, how can we use the SDG framework to look at the big, big topic of, of water resources. We are seeing clearly now that the global water commons are under major threat globally. And this is clearly seen in the freshwater systems that are due to major development upstream, economic development face severe pressures. And according to evidence, about as much as 80% of the world population face some form of water stress in the systems. Now, the impacts of that, we can clearly see, comes as water uh, release nutrients into our coastal zones and ecosystems, and we see dead zones developing along the coastal zones. A clear evidence of that is also around here in the, in the Baltic Sea region. And this is exponentially increasing over time, these dead zones that have an impact on coastal fisheries and have an impact on, on, on tourism and developing in the coastal zones. Now, not only that, the final is all, all the way up into the open oceans. And in the open oceans, we see clearly now that no marine area globally has, is, is not suffering from, from these impacts. And one aspect of that is, of course, ocean acidification, which is of, a part of the global climate change uh, problem as carbon dioxide is taking up in the water systems. Now, this is, of course, illustrates a huge challenge. But what can we then do? How can we try to address this in a different way? Now, what we've been doing, uh, we have been looking at the evidence uh, in, in a lot of projects and, and across the globe and how we try to address them from a governance and management perspective. And clearly, as we have heard before, we work very much in silos. So the idea here is, is can we connect the silo thinking from land resource systems that we're working into the freshwater systems, down to the estuaries and deltas, coastline, adjoining sea, and into the open oceans. We don't simply have that type of framework today, but as you can see here on the slide, we see how we have some key flows that are connecting these different segments. Water flows, sediment flows, pollutants, different form of pollutants, biota and material flow because of our, our major development in cities and along the coastal zones. But also coming back, a whole set of very positive uh, uh, ecosystem services like flood and drought uh, control, like freshwater, energy of course, you saw the, the hydropower dams. So now, can we find ways of, of linking that? And that's what our research has been looking at, and we have developed some theory of change on that. But just to see the connections, because the, so the Agenda 30 here is really something that can help in this. Overarching, of course, we have the fighting the poverty issue and climate change, as we've seen before. But we can also use the, these, these, uh, these systems, the SDG, to look at these different segments, terrestrial ecosystems, water and sanitation for all, modern energy, resilient infrastructure, and the cities, of course. They all link to this source to sea flow and sustainable use of the oceans, seas, and marine resources. Now, as you can see, unfortunately, the SDG framework did not use the source to sea system, but yet, anyhow, we can use it in order to identify what type of governance and management approaches could be realistic as we move forward. And to illustrate that, mm -hmm. I hand over to my colleague Marisa, who will be okay. case study from Colombia. Thank you. So let me take you to Colombia, and in particular to the Magdalena Basin. In, in the map, you can see the river that goes from the Andes north and to the Caribbean Sea. And the person in this image, Juan, I don't know Juan in person, but I have met people like him in Colombia who live in the lower part of the Magdalena and whose livelihood depends on the fish that are in this rich ecosystem of connected wetlands that have variable flows and seasonal flows that uh, are the ecosystem in which these fish live and that are also the livelihood for Juan. Uh, although these fish are not in the most pristine condition already because there are some levels of, of development, uh, Juan one's livelihood still depends on that. 
And let's go to another place of Colombia, to the mountains, where Rubiela, whom I do know because she's my aunt, uh, she lives in uh, this little town um, in the mountains that recently has experienced a tourism boom uh, because of its charming uh, architecture and colonial setting. And Rubiela is benefiting from this boom because she can rent the rooms in her house for these tourists. But for this business to be steady, she needs reliable water and energy supply. Well, as you can see, Juan and Rubiela probably live in very different worlds, but they are connected through this system. They live in the same basin, uh, in different places of this basin, which happens to be the most important basin in Colombia. is the Magdalena watershed, as I explained. It goes from uh, the Andes north to the Caribbean, 1,500 kilometers of length, is where 60% uh, of the Colombia population is located, 30 million people. The cities of Bogotá, Medellín are also located here. And it's also where 70% of Colombians' hydropower happens, which is a uh, um, and Colombians' electricity comes 70% from hydropower. So uh, it's a very important basin. And in years like El Niño, 2016, uh, the scarcity is spread out. And uh, of course, the talks for improving hydropower uh, are more pressing. And you can see the white triangles in the map show where all the new hydropower development is planned. And of course, hydropower is going to have other effects, land uh, impacts, and more energy for more development. So in order to understand these trade-offs, we uh, gathered the best information available, and we built a tool, a model, to understand what can be the effects of this hydropower development in the lower part, in the Montpós depression, where uh, Juan lives, and how can that affect the flows that are important for this ecosystem. And in this image, you can see uh, the change in flow with only 5% increase in this regulation of the hydropower. And you can see that the effect is not too big, and that perhaps Perhaps with this uh, scenario, Juan probably can still have good ecosystem for the fish, but perhaps Rubiela cannot get her steady energy. With the same uh, tool, we build now a more aggressive scenario where we can have a more regulated system with all the hydropower, the triangles now here, put in place. And of course, the regulation is much worse. Uh, we have the red line, which shows uh, a higher regulation, a higher change of flow. and. Uh, um, Above all, uh, what's happening here is because we have this dam, these dams for our hydropower that are continuously releasing water, we have a, sort of like an artificially constantly flooded uh, area in the lower part of the Magdalena, which uh, affects the flows that are necessary for the ecosystem. Uh, we need the low flows as well, this variability in the flooding, so we can have uh, protection and, and the necessary um, conditions for the early life stages of the fish. So in this case, perhaps Rubiela can get her energy, but Juan will be um, a greater effect on the fish. So uh, with this simple example and uh, not showing all the results, you can see how using these kinds of tools, we can uh, understand better the trade-offs and also quantify those trade-offs, which is very important. So we can start linking the effects of these SDGs uh, proposals and weigh the trade-offs uh, in between this linked water, energy, food ecosystem continuum. So we can uh, perhaps find solutions that are better uh, for all and hopefully uh, integrated solutions for uh, Juan and Rubiel. <laughs> uh, thank you, Marissa and Jacob. Uh, I'm just trying to think of uh, me taking that air-conditioned train and the air-conditioned mall and the problems I'm causing. I'm seeing that you as a scientist are solving those problems for me, so thank you. And uh, come to Bangkok and help me out. Um, so for the last part of this, uh, we're going to look at sustainable lifestyles. So could I please ask uh, Katerina Axelson, uh, project manager, and Evelyn Pirsalu, uh, senior expert, uh, to the stage. Thank you. So how many of you have had coffee today? Please raise your hands. <laughs> when having your coffee, did you realize that uh, coffee is one of the most traded commodities in the, in the world? And that uh, 125 million people worldwide rely on coffee for living. Majority of coffee production 
is exported from developing countries while consumed in Europe and in North America. For a long time now, Sweden's uh, consumption-based emissions, uh, uh, sorry, so for a long time now, Sweden's consumption-based impact in, in foreign countries have increased, as you can see from this graph here. And at the same time, the national emissions have, have decreased. And the pattern is similar in most developed countries. Uh, as, as shown here, uh, around 65% of the total Swedish emissions now occur in foreign countries. And while it is important to realize the global environmental impacts of our lifestyles and consumption and make efforts to reduce it. It's also important to understand that a lot of people depend on our consumption for their livelihoods. However, relying on trend, trade is obviously not enough to alleviate poverty and improve people's living standards. Developing countries still need improved governance structures and institutions, better access to education, infrastructure, and perhaps above all, adequate pay and secure job situations. We also need to understand that in order to uh, sustain nine billion people in 2050, with an equal and just distribution of the world's resources, many countries and income groups will need to reduce their consumption substantially while allowing others to increase theirs. This means that sustainable lifestyles to a large extent is also an equity issue. I'm aware that you cannot see the names of the countries in this graph, but the idea here is just to remind us that many countries have an average ecological footprint several times higher than what has been estimated as sustainable levels. At the top there, you have countries like Kuwait, US, Sweden, and even Estonia, where you come from, Evelyn, comes out pretty high. And at the end there, we have countries like Bangladesh, India, Senegal, and Nicaragua. And several of the SDGs are really fundamental for bringing about the necessary changes to address this imbalance. Sustainable lifestyle uh, encompasses many things. It's about social behavior and choices that minimize the negative impact on, on the environment. And that means that we, in de developed countries, need to reduce our consumption and waste uh, also less uh, resources. And one family that has recently started to contemplate and reflect on these issues is my uncles. So, please meet my uh, uncle's family. Uh, Uncle A Andrus and his wife Ruth, and his two uh, lovely children, Anu and, and Kaur. They live in a small town called Viljandi in uh, the middle of Estonia. Ruth is working in the Estonian State Forest Management Center, and uh, Andrus is in, uh, in the construction business. And they're not super rich, but they get by quite well uh, in Estonian terms. And we, my family and I, we, we meet often in Christmas times and, and uh, we have dinner together and discuss about different things. And, and last Christmas we started to talk about human impact on the, on the environment. And they wanted to get tips from me how, to, how they could uh, reduce their environmental impact. Both Ruth and Andrus, they have heard about the seriousness of global warming, but so far they have not found uh, inspiration to, to, to reduce uh, their environmental impact. But one thing that really started to change uh, the way we're thinking about these issues and started, started to think about these issues was one day when their daughter Anu came home from school. This was in last uh, autumn and declared that she wants to become, uh, or she will become a vegetarian. And that was because uh, at school she had heard that uh, food can have a very big impact on, on the environment and vegetarian food uh, is better for, for global environment. But the problem was that um, the school canteen 
doesn't really have uh, vegetarian food, as you see from the pictures. So she asked from her parents, could she bring her own food to the school? And the parents were thinking, well, this is the wrong way to go about it, and they decided to uh, talk with the school administration. And the response what they got was that, no, this is really difficult to do, and our chef doesn't even know how to make vegetarian cook, uh, go cook vegetarian food. And Ruth and Andrews was quite astonished by this answer, realizing the system does not, does not actually support the sustainable lifestyles. And then we went on talking about uh, the growing meat consumption in Estonia and how we waste so much more food and throw away so much of food. Um, in our study from uh, Tallinn Center, we have found out that average Estonian throws away 63 kilograms of uh, food each year. And even though may that's maybe not so much compared to other European countries, it is still comparably high of uh, what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa and southeastern uh, Asia, where people throw away only 6 to, to 11 kilograms of food. So this uh, made us also think about the time, not so long time ago, when we were living in quite tough situations in Soviet time, when we didn't have so much food, variety of different food available. And sometimes the empty stores were even quite empty, like you see from the, from the pictures. But we, and we didn't throw away so much uh, at that time. So how come that in just one generation later, our living standard has increased, which is a good thing, but we have also become so much more wasteful? And in fact, according to FAO Commission study, if just one-fourth of lost and wasted food was saved, it could actually end global hunger. But not only do we in developed countries waste so much food and throw it so much away, we also eat too much. And we eat too many of things that are not good for, for ourselves. But this, however, is a problem that happens also in uh, many other countries, so most of the countries all around the world. There is a clear correlation between income and waste. And that brings back uh, to our story in, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> story in uh, Estonia and, and experiences from, uh, from Soviet time. How can we prevent that increasing income and waste don't go hand in hand? How can we make sure that when e incomes are increased in developing countries, the waste would be actually reduced. Estonia is one of the first countries to present their plan of action um, for Agenda 2030 at the high-level panel in July. So what can a country like Estonia do mm -hmm. to support more sustainable lifestyles? Well, sustainable consumption has been addressed uh, at the national level so far to a considerable extent. And indeed, there is a clear rationale for introducing some key policy instruments at the national level. As we also heard Per Bulun talk about this morning, such as, for instance, a revised tax system, eco-labels, public procurement guidelines, building codes, and so on. However, many of these uh, instruments need to be actively responded to and enforced at the national, or sorry, at the local level, either by businesses or individuals making sustainable consumption choices in their local environment, or, or directly by local government in the role as planner, procurer, or role model. And in this process, it's important that the national level is in, is in dialogue with the local level to better understand the conditions, support, and structures needed to bring about the necessary changes. Another important success factor for bringing about changes for sustainable consumption and lifestyles is the social dimension. The motivating factors for people to change their lifestyles are likely different for different people, as well as the geographical and social contexts. It is likely, however, that we can identify a number of unifying factors regardless of the setting. 
From recent work that SEI has done here in Stockholm, we learned that the transformation can be greatly advanced if people start together to discuss these issues and take action together. For instance, setting up common gardens, arrange carpooling, car sharing, arrange cooking classes or nature walks. People are, in most cases, very committed to contribute to uh, an improved um, social community, to strengthen the social community at the local level. And if sustainable lifestyles are acknowledged as a social norm, this will greatly facilitate the transition. Plus, it's, it's fun. So we, but we also need to ensure that sustainable lifestyles do not only exist in the abstract. They must be created every day in the millions of choices that individuals make every day around the world. This suggests that we need to carefully consider how to build sustainable lifestyles around the social values that binds people together. Thank you. Evelyn and Katharina uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And I'd like to thank all of the presenters for all of the work they've done. They've shown for certain that there is a lot of linkages between the various different sustainable development goals. And for me, at least, I am thinking that you are all on the same language. So let's keep it going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niall. We're going to move straight on. We're running five minutes late, of course. That's always the way when you've got interesting presentations and speakers. Um, and I'm going to invite onto the stage two uh, wonderful, uh, and we're very honoured to have them with us, Charlotte Petrigonitska, who is the General Director of SIDA, and Henrik Henriksson, the CEO of Scania. Thank you. Welcome. And a round of applause. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Before we get going, I just want to reassure you, we're going to steal five minutes from people's coffee break. I'm, I'm really sorry, guys, <laughs> okay? I just hope that you us. can... <laughs> um, so that we get a chance, really, to have a bit of a conversation. And we, we framed this, this around uh, defining the challenges of, of, of implementation. And we, we want to invite you guys here, because you sort of represent two different constituencies, if you like, but yes. friends nonetheless, I know, and with different experiences and different mandates. And I, so I want to sort of start off by asking you a sort of basic question, which is, so why do the SDGs matter for you, Charlotte? Why do they matter for SIDA? Well, for, for CEDA, this is the really the agenda that we have been working with for so many years, not, but, but not expressed like this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, a very inspirational agenda because we've been together with many of you. Uh, we have worked so hard to try to educate ourselves and others that it's it's not one issue. It's not health, education. We just need to understand that we need to work more in an integrated way and based on knowledge. So, so this is really guiding us. But I want to say something. This is not a development aid agenda. It's not about us. It's about you. <laughs> uh, and it, but it's, it is an agenda for development, which we need to understand from CEDA, that this is not a donor-driven development aid agenda. So we need to think through the way we work to be able to be inspired, but to really reach out to other actors that are the solution. And finally, on this uh, first response, that I've been in so many meetings. Per Bulon was referring to many of them last year, uh, where we talk about the private sector and the capital markets as, as a necessary solution to, to, to finding the resources for this agenda. But we never, we very seldom talk with you because you're not there because you don't need all the development acronyms or the bureaucracies and all. So you, we're talking about what you need to do uh, without you at the table and that's not going to work. So that's, that's why we need to find a way to reach out to, to, to you and others who we hope will be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. so. 
So, Henrik, what about you? I mean, the, you've, you've been sort of put on the spot a little bit. This agenda is about <laughs> broadly about development. It's not about aid. And, yeah. and as, as I think Charlotte has put forward, you know, development means jobs and it means investments. Mm -hmm. That's perhaps where you no, come in. So I why does it matter? We, we are on the same uh, wavelength here. I mean, we work well together. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the Swedish leadership for sustainable development that is organized by CEDA. We are participating there. Uh, I think it's one of the arenas where we actually put... Uh, uh, yeah, put, I would say, the, the political agenda aside and we just focus on doing things together yeah. and, and uh, looking at what sort of barriers do we have and try to remove them together. Uh, actually, we sit in there across industries, but we also sit in the players that are usually competitors. But if we sit in that arena, we are actually able to sort of come up with things together. Yeah. But uh, coming back to um, our role in this, then of course, that, that uh, yeah, the 17 goals—they are—they are a good manuscript for us as well in the uh, in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I would say that they are an inspiration for us to create a business plan with turning these 17 goals into business solutions that we can provide to our uh, customers of today and probably our customers tomorrow. And I think that is generic whichever industry you're into. If you're into our industry transport or if you're into producing food or services or electricity or whatever it is. So I think it, it is an inspiration to become a, uh, a business plan uh, for the future. And uh, of course, for us as a company, we use them both to make sure that we live um, live by these, uh, these goals, and, and, and that means the transformation in the company as such when it comes to the value chain we're into, our suppliers, our customers, our customers' customer, our own operation. But I think where we, as many companies, can do a, a big difference is uh, in the products and services that we provide. And, and there we have, uh, before uh, this 17 goals came up, but uh, we, we had a, a game plan and we have an ambition as Scania to uh, be recognized as the leader of the transformation of transport system to become sustainable. Mm -hmm. and, and based on that, we have a couple of pillars that we work with. And, and the funny thing is that those pillars, you can actually, yeah, you recognize them in the 17 goals, which I think is a strength. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, can I ask a question around, I mean, Per Boland mentioned uh, what, food, housing, and transport. And, and this comes up to you. I mean, yeah. your transport sector, but you're also responsible, I suppose, for yeah, the, the logistics of getting the food to the supermarkets that gets on our plates. Yeah. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how perhaps you can't do it all on your own, that it's, it's about the partnerships with others and, yeah, and developing right. value for them? I, <coughs> you're right. You're absolutely right. I think if we start with what we can do ourselves, is that we're focusing on three areas. One is energy efficiency, which I think everyone can understand what that is, to so make the, the vehicles uh, more energy efficient. The second one is to use renewable fuels and electricity. Uh, and I'll come back to that one. Uh, and then the third one is to use some smart transport. Um, but I would say in all of these three pillars, you cannot do it on your own, and not one of them is the silver bullet solution. So you have mm -hmm. to have to work with both or, or all three of them, and you also have to work in partnership because you're always just a small player in a big value chain. And if you don't go up and take a holistic view of that value chain, you will not see the waste. Mm. Uh, and you will not see the, the, the challenges that mm -hmm. you have. Uh, I think one example is, is biofuels. Uh, I think at the moment in Europe there is a, a new directive coming up at the end of the year, so there's a lot of sort of articles coming out now, and it's a little bit bashing biofuels. Mm -hmm. and, and it really makes me really angry, to mm -hmm. be honest. And, 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 because, and I don't have a stake in that. It doesn't matter for us what, what sort of fuel you put in our vehicles. But what irritates me is that we sometimes take a very narrow view of, of a subject instead of go up and look at it from a holistic point of view. I don't know how many of you have been to the river delta in Nigeria where they produce oil. Or how many of you have been in Basra region in southern Iraq? Mm. I've been there. Mm. It's not a beautiful sight. And, and, and for some reason, we use another type of goggles when we look at biofuel production instead of how we look at fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there was a funny picture here before, I think Richard was showing about sort of the, the power struggle between food and, and, and fuel. I would say that the, that sort that I don't agree with that at all. I mean, there is no conflict at all. I think it's fueled by, by interest that has a second agenda. In Europe, we're spending more, we use more land in Europe for golf courses than we do to produce biofuels. Yeah. 
And if I remember, you use quite a lot of water to get the green and gra grass to become green as well. So, you're, you're, so I think we you're have not a golfer, are you? No, no. no <laughs> I, actually, I actually <laughs> am. I have quite a good handicap, but I'm. <laughs> But, but, uh, How can you live with it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but I think what, what I'm trying to make a point of is that you need to look from holistic yeah, points of view. And that's where our cooperation yes. comes in. I mean, we, we do a lot of things together where, where actually, if, if um, an issue regarding the transport industry comes from Charlotte, it's more credible. And if maybe I talk a little bit more about uh, sustainable development in, in some of the sub-Saharan Africa countries, I become more trustworthy. So I think we use and each other's sort of, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we use the partnership yeah. in a proactive way. And, and may I add to that? Because I think we all re need to rethink the way we do the work we do today to be able to deliver on this agenda. And CEDA and other agencies, we have been focusing a lot on how, how to find the best way to put our money into a solution. And maybe we have developed certain expertise on thematic areas, like yeah. we know what quality education looks like. But are we experts on knowing how to inspire the partnerships that are needed, or the debates that are needed? Yeah. So we take uh, the goal 17 very seriously, which is about me of implementation and about partnerships because we, we think that that's where we that's our core business because the agenda is broad mm. uh, but to deliver the agenda is what the agency is, is, is part of doing so we need to understand who do we need around the table uh, to find the integrated solutions and what kind of, of, of debates or discussions do we need to, to, to trigger because for instance we, we don't want private sector to start charities in, in, in Africa, we want them to pay the taxes hmm. in countries, exactly. uh, which is an elephant in the room. I mean, it's not discussed. And when we work under the heading of Swedish leadership, and Per Bolund and others are talking about Sweden as a leading country, we also need to be leading on making the things we do based on research and knowledge, but also uh, lead on, on, on the uh, things that could be conflicting goals mm. uh, and dare to take discussions. And I think that's also where we could be very inspirational internationally. And I think we do. Mm. We, we, we do debate those kind of interfaces yeah, no, we do, we we, all, do, all the time. So. No, we do. And I think we actually, <laughs> just on that tax thing, actually, we have, the, we have defined, I think it is 19 KPIs that we yeah. follow that is linked to sustainability. And after a dialogue like this, we actually put in tax. We want to be profitable. We are proud to be profitable, but we're also proud to pay tax. Yeah. And we see that actually as one of the KPIs that we should follow because uh, not everyone good. is seeing it as, as a good thing, but mm -hmm. we have to. <gasps> we have to. Mm. Can I ask you, we talk, this is sort of defining the challenges. Mm. Uh, from your perspective, Charlotte, uh, it, are there any sort of challenges from the point of view of CEDA for you know, actually making this happen on the ground? Uh, what, could you name a couple of them? Be candid with us. Let us know how no, we I, can I, help. I, I, did, I did actually, I did, I did already by saying <laughs> that we need to understand what's the relevant role for an agency in, in implementing this strategy and five to 10 years down the road. Mm. Uh, Swedish development aid money is important, but they are decreasing in proportion mm. to other countries' development aid money or to private sector and remittances and so on. Mm. So we need to understand a bit more, how do we uh, transform ourselves from a big donor, mm. where we were acting like that, to being more, you know, uh, knowing where to work and how to be catalytical uh, and, and how to use our money and, and knowledge where other actors and other money is not necessarily going. So we, we need to rethink. We, we were the big guys. We, w we will now be more of the kind of Ville uh, Vesla. What's that? I mean, you know, the, 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 an agency that can, can inspire others to work, but we are part of much bigger solutions than the... Than, and, and that is a cultural change within the organization um, CEDA. Mm. And the whole, I would say, all agencies that do what we do have to rethink the role. And one of the things that we have done, uh, Per Boulon talked about 
Swedish agencies have a role to contribute to the implementation here in Sweden. We have a role of engaging Sweden to, to get to know more about the global goals. So we, we have reached out to other agencies, to civil society, to, to academia and to private sector to start to build platforms where our money is not what we offer. It's the platforms and, and, and knowledge sharing that yeah. we are offering. Mm -hmm. And then the money will m might be a part of it. And what I'm saying now is also uh, replicated in countries. It's not just in headquarters in Stockholm. It's the w mm. role we're going to see more of in the countries which we work in. So I, I, ca I can support on that actually also. that. Um, when we go out and do bigger projects linked to sustainability in a broader sense, that, then uh, um, it's, it's not the money that is important. It is the knowledge. The knowledge that we can get from CEDA, from, from uh, EKN, from uh, SAK, from Sw uh, Sweat Fund, uh, sort of institutions that are supporting not with, with money as such, but with credibility that can open up doors and with knowledge that will create a better sort of solution at the end of the day. I think one great example where, where I think Sweden has supported uh, Scania very good. It's, it's uh, a project we're doing in India where we are taking a holistic view of a whole system. Usually we provide buses and trucks and, and then we say good luck. But here we have seen that if you want to provide buses in a very corrupt system in India, mm. yeah, it doesn't work. So what we have done instead is that we have gone in and moved forward into the value chain and we actually took the role of what SL is in Stockholm and we actually operate the buses. Uh, and we don't stop there, but we also start producing the biofuels ourselves because there was no knowledge about how to do it. And we invite other Swedish companies to come on board. Uh, we make sure it's local business. So we take residuals from the uh, production of rice and, and we take the wastewater from, uh, from the sewage. You know, 600 toilets is enough to run a bus for a year. So, uh, and, 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 and that's what we do. So we produce mm -hmm. the fuel, uh, we set up a transport system, mm -hmm. and, and we, we run it. And basically, we avoid uh, hard currency going to uh, fossil fuel in India, which is scarce, create local jobs, we improve the air quality, uh, and, and we create also uh, uh, a better sort of CO2 uh, footprint, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's financially viable. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I think, and that would not be, that, would, that is much easier if you have a strong partner with you that can come in with knowledge and credibility. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, and that understands that your driving force is not to become what we are. No. You're not. You're not merging in. You're mm. not merging with CEDA to become mm. a charity or a development no. agency. No. You're still. And we need to understand that you will only do this if this is good business for you in the mm. long run. And knowing each other's driving forces and reasons for being is so important when we are talking about partnering. Because if we don't, we will see a lot of partnerships that will fail sooner rather than later. And I think we underestimate what that takes. Mm. Uh, I also think one, one of the things that CEDA not struggles with, but what we, what we see is that the level of engagement for within private sector on this agenda is more around COP21 and Paris rather than the 17 goals, all of them. So we, we have to continue to mm. communicate, but also to allow companies to enter into this agenda just you know, knowing one of the objectives and then broaden the understanding of how they are linked. Because, and we, are, you know, we come from the poverty, si poverty side, uh, and, and I still think what SAE does uh, on, on this, we have, to, we have to realize that when it comes to private sector, the in, uh, climate and environment is easier to get in engagement around rather than some of the social uh, objectives. So please mm. partner with us in, in making this truly integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very interesting to hear how you're, you're talking about your role as being, first of all, focusing on the things where you can really add value and, and, and make a change, and then you're, you're there to convene mm -hmm. and enable a yes. whole load of other people. So it's about leveraging a much bigger sort of mm -hmm. both pot of money, if you like. Yep. I'm going to press you on that a little bit. I mean, in terms of are there ways in which the, the, the financing that CEDA or the aid that CEDA has could be used to sort of unlock, if you like, some much bigger amounts yeah, of money? Absolutely. I mean, there is a 
absolutely. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> no, but no, uh, CEDA has two, uh, two kind of pots of money. One is the one that you really know of, grants, gåvor, uh, where we can be smarter in using them where other money are not so interested. For instance, feasibility studies or the, the, the core support that nobody wants to pay for because core, what is that? I want a result. Paying for a secretariat, nobody wants to pay for a secretariat. Things like that, or in conflict areas where you mm. would be hesitant. Mm. So we need to be smarter on where we use the grants. Then we have a guarantee, which means that we can, we can share risk. So instead of giving a grant to a woman in Palestine who want and, and is able to start her own business if she could lend money. Instead of giving her a grant, we support the National Bank, who are a bit, it's too risky for them to lend, but if we guarantee a first loss, uh, they are willing to lend. So instead of supporting her, we're supporting systems in country with a guarantee, which is not giving away money, it's actually a, a good business for Sweden to do that. So de-risking uh, with other actors is much more part of what we're do doing today. Uh, and that unlocks a lot of new ways of working, which is actually Sweden and CEDA is a bit, not famous, but famous within the development uh, agency area of uh, doing. We are, there's uh, not so many others yeah. who can do that, actually. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I wanted to finish off, actually, uh, since I'm sure everyone is desperate for a bit for of coffee, coffee yes. and everything like that. I mean, I don't want to cut the time short. It's, it's fascinating to hear from you. But, but I wanted to sort of ask you, we've got 15 years, and it's a very ambitious agenda. And, and when you look at the national implementation, it's, it's also, you know, almost overwhelming, yes. actually. I, I just wondering, are there, first of all, you can answer whichever one of these you like. Are there specific priorities you think that should be addressed now? And where would you like to see, if you were looking into your crystal ball, where, where, do you, where would you like to see, either as a representative of business or indeed in your personal capacity, you know, where would you like to see us in five or seven and a half years, sort of halfway down the track? Henrik first. Yeah, I, I think... Um, <laughs> The re industry I represent, I mean, we, we stand for around 14 to 15 percent of the CO2 uh, in, in the world. So, so we are part of the problem. So, so uh, we, we want to be part of the solution, of course. That's why we have the agenda we have. But saying that, I would say that the partnerships, one partner in the partnership chain is, is uh, uh, the legislator. Uh, I would say, and, and I think th that is the process, <laughs> unfortunately, it takes the longest time to develop technology and convince customers and so on. That goes a little bit quick, but the legislation, so that is what I would like to see now. I was a long-term commitment from a political arena that is not local, but that is pan whatever, pan European or pan global, uh, so that you give the right uh, games of the rule, not only for the manufacturers, but, the, but, uh, but also I would say especially for the customers. They are the ones that are worried. If I buy this technology today, will it be fueled tomorrow? But if I buy this now, what will happen? I mean, I think we have all experienced that in Sweden with our sort of personal cars. So that is what I would like to see, uh, sort of a, a good sort of uh, solid performance when it comes to uh, the political arena to set the rules of the games. And, and, and then do not uh, dictate sort of the technology solution, sort of uh, rather sort of aim for say, saying, what is it that you want to achieve? Then you can let, let the sort of let rest of the society find the solution. So, so that is today the most important, I would say. Mm. Thank you, Henry. Shalom. I think I think it's 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 hard. There's so much you want to say. For, uh, one of the things that I would like to see happen is that the 600 million people living in Africa without electricity, uh, that they have el electricity, because it's the basis for so many things that we we need to see happen, from from being able to to read, to deliver birth in the night time, to to make. Africa industrialized. You just need that. And if we can do that based on, on sustainable solutions, I think that's very, very important. I also think that 
thinking through the vision for Sweden in this, because Sweden said we're going to lead uh, by, by understanding what it means for us in Sweden, but also internationally. And, and I think that uh, if we can say in, in, in five years that we were modeling in Sweden, models that we are already known for, we are known for our gender, uh, gender issues, uh, we are known for welfare models that are badly needed. When we talk about private sector and taxes and all of that, we talk about welfare models. So if we could not say that we are the best in the world on welfare models, but if we could see that there's a, we are really asked to uh, contribute uh, to modeling welfare models uh, in, in other countries, I think we will be so good at what we're doing here and so helpful. And this agenda for me, the, the whole agenda is about uh, an, an, an equity agenda within planetary boundaries. Uh, it, it's, it's not about poverty, it's more about an equal world within mm. planetary bonds. And I think that Sweden can really play a role there, role based there. on welfare models, gender, and the climate issue. So, so I'd like to, I think I'd like to see us in a competition there, because it's a good competition. <laughs> so. Great. So. Thank you very much, Henrik yep. and Charlotte, for, for those insights. In, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Henrik, don't run away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A little bit of housekeeping. Thank you. Thank you. Coffee, tea, and a muffin is available um, behind you and also upstairs. Do feel free also to take a look at the work of our scribe, Saif Al Hassani, who's uh, been working over here. And then I know we're running a bit late, so uh, if you can be back in your seats in 20 minutes, that would be great. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, it's time to uh, take your coffee and your seats, please, for our second half. This is your last and final call, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats for our second half. Uh, don't forget, everybody, there is the opportunity to mingle over a cocktail afterwards, so this isn't your only opportunity to talk to uh, friends old and new. Thank you very So welcome back, everybody. Um, and to take us um, into our second session and perhaps also bridge between our first hour and a half looking at interlinkages, um, I'd like to introduce you to Mons Nilsson, SEI's research director, who's going to kick us off and give us some conceptual ideas of what coherence is and how we might get there. Welcome, Mons. Thank you, Rob. Uh, indeed, uh, I am the research director of SEI, and therefore I will allow myself to become a little bit academic here for a few minutes and talk a little bit about coherence. How do you approach a topic like policy coherence, this holy grail of public administration, coherent joined up policy making? And to do that, I think we have to start by understanding the interactions in a more systematic way. We have um, the most perhaps cited quote on the 2030 agenda um, globally has been the indivisible whole. That the agenda, you can't pick it apart, you need to do everything. Um, when uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was here in Stockholm about two months ago, he talked about it as a declaration of interdependence. 
And this interact interdependence element is so strong that even policy coherence has its own target under Goal 17. Um, of course, this can be put in sharp contrast with the, um, the way that actual political processes work, which is about negotiation and breaking different interests against each other. It's really a, not an indivisible view at all. It's a quite divisible view. And you also see that, let's say, the most influential policy analytical research that we have today, of course, is the tradition of economics. It's always uh, founded on the issue of trade-offs and see allocation of resources if in competing uh, uh, under constraints. So. Already today, we've heard a lot about uh, synergies and trade-offs. And this is the regular rhetoric about the SDGs. There are synergies and there are trade-offs. But how do policymakers deal with that and how can they approach them? It is actually not clear-cut that it's only a two-way uh, coin, synergy and trade-off. So I will submit to you today that there is actually a much wider typology of interactions that we need to understand if we want to develop coherent policies. Um, and they range from the most positive type of interaction being the indivisible, which is a case where two things basically go hand in hand and they cannot be separated. So let's say we are able to achieve full uh, empowerment of women and uh, women's rights in society. That, of course, goes entirely hand in hand with women participating in all decision-making fora, which is another target under gender equality. Let's give that the score plus three. Uh, plus two, also very positive, is the reinforcing relationship. It's an interaction where you pursue one goal, such as, for instance, clean cooking, and you will automatically reinforce another, namely exposure to air pollution in indoor settings in developing countries. The th weakest form of positive interaction, we'll call it enabling. An example could be electricity access, which is an enabling factor for being able to pursue education goals and health goals in poor countries. Uh, enabling, uh, for instance, homework to be done at night, enabling evening schools, uh, of course, enabling uh, uh, health clinics to operate. Uh, there is a neutral relationship, we, talk, we call it consistent, where there are no significant positive or negative interactions. Then we move into the negative sphere, and we have three levels there as well. And the, mi the mildly negative interaction is the condition, the conditionality. That, for instance, you have put the constraint on the way that you can deliver energy services because of the climate change uh, target. The climate change goals tell us that we cannot deliver energy services based on fossil fuels. More negative, minus two, we can call it, counteraction, where a target is actually working directly against another target. Some would say that labor rights is counteracting free enterprise. Some say that food production, uh, or let's say biofuel production, is counteracting food security. As you understand, many of these are actually contestable, and they are very place-specific, but they still have to be analyzed. The third and the most negative uh, interaction is the dilemma, where two things just simply cannot go together. There are not that many of them, I think, but one could be, for instance, the, uh, the goal of having, of, uh, having full transparency in public decision-making versus national security considerations, for instance. We cannot reveal everything on the national security agenda publicly because it would be uh, extremely damaging to our national security. So this provides a kind of a typology that we have begun to think about in terms of the SDGs. Uh, as I said, it's contestable, it's uh, place-specific, it depends on a number of factors, such as the geographical conditions, the resources available in a specific country or a region. 
but it also shows a little bit the solution space and what you can think about is how you move from a negative to a positive interaction or sort of climb the ladder for instance through applying smart technologies or for instance through applying appropriate governance systems that takes away some of the negative interactions and uh, emphasizes and reinforces the positive interactions. I will not linger more on this. Uh, I think it gives us a slightly more nuanced understanding of policy coherence and how we can approach it as analysts, but I think it also gives a little bit an opportunity for policymakers and even perhaps politicians to think about who are your friends and who are your enemies in the political system. Where do you build alliances and coalitions? What becomes the central pillars of a development strategy where all the big synergies are joining together? And which parts do you need to mitigate and deal with uh, a little bit more carefully? So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed, Mons. Um, that was a really interesting presentation, and I think it sets very nicely the context for the uh, next session that will follow. I should probably perhaps just introduce myself. My name is um, Lisa Emberson, and I'm the Centre Director from the York Centre. Um, I think I was sort of spoke to you just before we started to try and see if I could paraphrase what it was that, that you were talking about. And I think perhaps the best I can come up with was that you were talking about trying to understand the different types of policy interaction. Um, and perhaps one way of saying that is trying to identify the good, the bad, and the ugly, and trying to make sure that we avoid the bad and the ugly and make the very best that we can from the good. So that's what I took from what you said. Um, so I'd like to introduce this next sec uh, session, which is um, looking at where policy coherence is needed. And we're going to look at three particular examples um, and hopefully sort of, uh, I think, delve a little bit deeper into some of the policy interactions that Mons was alluding to. Um, and these three different examples are going to be incredibly important in terms of us actually being able to uh, take our development forwards in a sustainable way. So um, if I can ask uh, the first two presenters to come onto the stage. So we have, um, we're going to have a discussion about cities now. And we're going to have um, Derek Burkhoff, uh, who's a senior scientist from the US Center in Seattle. And we're also going to have Anne Niambani um, from the SCI Africa Center. So thank you very much. Over to you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about one dimension of policy coherence related to governance. Um, for a while now, uh, and I would say increasingly in the last few years, there's been a growing awareness that if we're going to tackle the global challenges of sustainable development, we need to pay a lot of attention to urban areas, to cities. About half of the world's population currently lives in cities, and that proportion is expected to grow to about two-thirds by the middle of the century. So whether you're talking about climate change, resource consumption, or human well-being, cities are where uh, we really need, need to focus. So the question is, how do we engage with cities on urban sustainability? And if you talk with a lot of folks who are active in this area, uh, trying to promote sustainable development in cities, uh, you'll find there's a popular narrative, especially in the advocacy community, that cities should play a leadership role, city governments. Uh, to use a maritime analogy, they should be lighthouses, uh, showing us the way to good, effective policy, innovation, Cities have unique capacities and resources. Uh, they're more nimble than national governments. They can take up the slack when national governments have failed to act. And in, in its more extreme formulations, you'll find uh, expressions like this, this quotation from New York's deputy mayor. Uh, cities are centers of innovation. This is where climate change will be solved. Maybe we don't even need national governments. We simply need to unleash the innovative capacity of, of city governments. Uh, and when it, while it's undoubtedly true uh, that uh, we need leadership from cities, uh, where they can provide it, where it's needed, 
arguably, if we want to see uh, the transformative effects uh, that we need to see for global sustainable development, we need more than just the actions of a few leadership cities. So an alternative way to think about the appropriate proper role of cities uh, is to continue with the maritime analogy here, to think of cities as rowers, all rowing together towards sustainable development objectives. And what this conception would mean is not so much that cities take a leadership role, but they serve critical implementation roles, they're administrators, they would be strategic partners, working together with different levels of government, with the national level, for example, to achieve urban sustainability goals. For example, um, it's great if you have some cities moving forward with aggressive uh, building energy efficiency standards, um, but if you really want to see transformative effects, it's arguably better to have those standards enacted at national levels and have cities serve uh, the implementation and enforcement role for those standards. So this slide illustrates some of the challenge that we have before us. Uh, this shows the results of some analysis that we did a couple years ago, trying to quantify what the potential is for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in cities around the world. These are different kinds of actions that city governments could take related to buildings, related to transportation and urban form that could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And what this shows is that half the potential is concentrated in uh, a relatively small number, about 660 large urban areas. But the other half is dispersed throughout 5,000 urban areas throughout the world, uh, smaller and medium-sized cities. And the question is, how can we unlock the potential in those cities? Uh, yes, you have a lot of big cities kind of leading the charge here, but uh, we need to access uh, the, the reduction potential uh, and the sustainable development potential uh, across a range of issues in, the, in these smaller cities. And so the question then is, you know, if that's our aspiration, what is a coherent, uh, rational approach to governance uh, on climate change and on other certain sustainability issues look like? And I, what I would argue and, and what our analysis uh, argues is that the best approach would be to allocate responsibilities to different levels of government according to what they do best. So you look at the comparative advantages, what can cities do, what can national governments do, um, and allocate you know, design policies uh, in an integrated fashion according to those advantages. So what do cities do best? Uh, well, anything that depends on existing local government capacities, for example, it would be something appropriate to assign to cities. So maybe you want to have building codes established or promulgated at a national level. Uh, but city governments do a lot of building inspections already. They have a natural role in terms of enforcing those building codes. So there's one allocation of responsibilities. Anytime the success of policies depends on access to local data and information, mobilization of local resources, responsiveness to local concerns, that's where city government action is appropriate. And probably the... the um, you know, exhibit A in uh, what it makes sense for local governments, city governments to undertake is the development of public transit infrastructure, public transit systems, where all of these things come into play. What do national governments do best? Um, anytime you're concerned about achieving economies of scale, uh, market transformation effects, where coordination of action across multiple jurisdictions is needed, uh, where you need to avoid spillover effects, right? It's great if a city can reduce emissions within its boundaries, but if all that does is displace sources to other cities, other locales, you haven't actually reduced global emissions. So that's where national level approaches make sense uh, and avoiding free riding, for example. So the clear example here would be, uh, for example, energy efficiency standards. There's only so far you can go with individual jurisdictions. Arguably what you want is a transformative approach um, at the national level that cities would then help uh, in, in the implementation and administration of. 
So what does it take to achieve policy coherence? Uh, arguably, what you need is multiple levels of government working together uh, towards common goals here and eliminating conflicts between national and subnational policies. Policies should be designed around the respective comparative advantages of different levels of government. Uh, and really, what we need, I think, are national urban development strategies that enable city governments to act by providing financial and technical assistance and establishing frameworks that coordinate policies at multiple levels to get cities rowing together towards sustainable development. So with that, I will turn it over to Anne, who will talk about some concrete examples of uh, coherence or incoherence, as the case may be. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Derek. Uh, just following up on uh, what Derek has been talking about, the importance of uh, policy coherence, I'll give a case study in Nairobi, Kenya, where we've really had uh, diverse impacts of policy incoherence, and especially when we are faced with the extreme weather events. And the, re the most recent event in Nairobi was flooding that happened within the city, and those are some of the pictures that you could see in Nairobi. We had uh, vehicles being swept away as they tried to cross through the roads because they were flooded. And we also had uh, traffic congestion. So people spend eight to 10 hours as they tried to wait for the water to actually, uh, the level of the water to go down for them to cross and go home. And then we, we also had uh, people where the, some residents of Nairobi, they tried to help the others to actually cross the flooded uh, areas. and. Uh, and in, other, in another case, somewhere in an, in an informal settlement in Nairobi, we had a building that actually collapsed and it caused a lot of death uh, in that area. And also we had people who were left homeless because of that, because of uh, policy incoherence. And thinking about why does this happen, especially in the Kenyan context, uh, one of the thing is we have very nice policies that could actually help us when, we, when uh, we have such extreme weather events, but they are not being reinforced at the, at the local level. This includes the building codes that we have and also the land use regulation frameworks that we have in the country that are not being enforced. And also the role of the government to protect, to protect f uh, flood regulating ecosystem, sub, uh, ecosystems in, within the city are not being protected. And also there is uh, poor solid waste management and uh, lastly, it's infrastructure de development. There are so many buildings coming up that, are, that are, they don't follow the policies and also the regulatory framework that are being laid down. The second one is about incoherent and also fragmented uh, approaches when it comes to urban planning. And this, I'll, I'll, I'll use this slide to look at it. We have, uh, in Kenya, we have uh, two levels of governance. We have the national level and also the county levels. But the two, the two levels don't work. Uh, co uh, they are not coordinated when it comes to their work. And also, if you look at, at the county level, we also have subsectors within that are supposed to be working together. And that includes the development control. We have the land use. We have housing. We have water management and also environmental management. Uh, sectors that are supposed to work together, but this is not happening. So, so this, uh, so, uh, some, of this, uh, some of this conflicting and also lack of integration when it comes to, to uh, management of also, and also planning for any development in the, in the country is leading to very diverse uh, um, impacts that would be avoided if everything was done correctly. And the, the main key, key solution for this will be development of adaptive policy processes. They are actually they are coordinated, they should be coordinated, and also they should be reinforced uh, within this, uh, this sector so that we ensure that when we have such extreme weather events, the impacts are not as diverse as, uh, as they are. And then another thing is, we as uh, residents of Nairobi, we have a role to play because it's us who dump waste anywhere. So uh, when, when we have such extreme weather events, 
the drainage system is, is blocked and then the impact is even more diverse. So this is an example of, a, of a, an informal settlement in Nairobi where there's a lot of garbage that is blocking the drainage system. So when we have a lot of water, the water have nowhere to go. And uh, since our infrastructure are not built in a way that they can actually, uh, they, they don't have the capacity to hold such, such weather, they collapse. And the dilemma that we have uh, is that right now, at least we, we, can, we can come up with policies that could, uh, could uh, protect the residents from such extreme weather events. But what about the 1,000 ha houses that we have in Nairobi that are built on wetlands? What about the new road that you're seeing? This road is actually like th two years old that was constructed. Are we supposed to demolish it and now like construct like uh, weather resistant roads? Are we, uh, where are we supposed to take the people who are living in the 1,000 houses that are built in the wetlands? So that's the dilemma that we have. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, ever so much, um, Derek and Anne. I think you, um, that was a, a, a really interesting uh, discussion that you had there. I, I think it really kind of shows that the systemic approach that Mons was talking about, if we can get that right um, in 5,000 cities around the world, then we can really make some difference. And by the looks of the situation in Nairobi at the moment, then difference does definitely need to be made. So thank you very much for that. Um, moving on to the next example, we now have um, Michael Lazarus, who's the center director um, from the US Center. And we have Marion Davis, our senior communications um, officer. So anybody who works for SEI knows Marion Davis. Um, and you are going to be talking about fossil fuels and the energy transition. Thank you. Oh, I need to do that myself. How did that ever end up all over there? OK. So we are going to fo focus on a very specific set of issues, which is related to energy for development versus a safe climate. Can we? achieve this, and how do we deal with the pesky problem of fossil fuels? So the SDGs are incredibly ambitious, um, SDG number one especially, ending poverty in all its forms everywhere, is a very, very big task, especially when we consider that there are Right now, one in eight people in the world lives on less than $2 a day. So clearly, there are very big gaps to be filled. And uh, we also, for the first time ever, have an SDG on energy. We have vowed to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And again, huge gap to fill. Here we have 1.2 billion people with no access to electricity, many, many more whose access is really quite terrible. And we have 2.7 billion people who are still cooking with wood, dung, sticks, whatever they can find, and they have no, thing, no other option. And then on the other hand, we have SDG number 13, take urgent, access, ur urgent action to avoid, to combat climate change and its impacts. And obviously climate change affects every aspect of development outcomes, so this is very important to achieve as well. So can we achieve all three of these together? Obviously, we have enough energy of the clean, low-carbon kind, like solar. This is not a big deal. But right now, about 80% of our energy comes more from that kind of thing. That, in particular, is an oil pump. It's not as obvious as it should be. <laughs> but um, oil and coal and other, you know, and get natural gas are the main sources of energy for us right now. And this is not just a poor country issue. I mean, it is very much an issue for developing countries because it is these countries that have to greatly grow their energy supplies to be able to meet all their goals and to be able, you know, to not just to make people's living conditions better, but also to fuel industry, to mechanize agriculture. It, it affects every aspect of life. I mean, you know, even healthcare and education are just, you cannot do this without good energy. And at the same time, also, for many of these countries, this is the wealth they have. If you have oil in the ground and you are an incredibly poor country, it's a big deal to get, you know, to get that out and start exporting it. On the other hand, in rich countries, as you know well from some of the debates that are happening right now in, about natural gas pipelines in Europe, it's, 
you know, energy security is a really serious concern. And you know, in the United States where I come from, you know, the whole in energy independence theme is a really big issue. And this is, people are terrified that if we don't produce enough oil ourselves, that somehow somebody's going to leave us with you know, five kilometer long lines at the gas pump. So this is where we come in. Because we know that we are in one place and we need to get to another place. <laughs> and so we're trying to figure out how do we deal with this fossil fuel economy? Because the fossil fuel economy isn't just Th you know, things being c coming out of the ground. There is a whole institutional framework that supports them. There, you know, there are policies that support them. There, there, there are agencies and governments that support them. There are major corporations, um, enormous amounts of money flowing into these things. And all of these things that we're building that right now are useful also lock us into making that our future if we don't watch out. So now I'm going to turn over to Michael. Thank you, Marion. So, there are hopeful signs. Um, and I'm gonna actually read a quote. I don't you tend to do this, but I thought it was, you know, quite stunning that, um, you know, leaders of prominent international institutions are really taking heed of this dilemma, this incoherence. So, uh, Fatih Birol, executive direct, now executive director of the International Agency, said about two-thirds of all proven Reserves of oil, gas, and coal will have to be left undeveloped if the world is to achieve the goal of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius. We're not even talking 1.5 in that quote. And then Angel Guria, the executive director of the OECD, very interesting speech he, he gave in 2013. To wean ourselves away from fossil fuels will, be mean, will mean swimming against very strong tides. Governments everywhere, on behalf of their citizens, have major stakes in bringing fossil fuel to market and taking their share of the rents or profits. Carbon entanglement, a great term, will not be easily undone, and the very modest progress of climate policy over the last two decades is in part a testament to that. That's our challenge. Indeed, national policies if you look around national policies on climate, they focus almost exclusively on reducing the demand for fossil fuels. We don't talk much about the fact, or we haven't until recently, very recently. This graph shows you the global investment in upstream oil and gas, that is, everything that brings gas and oil to markets, increased threefold in a decade. And, of course, we all know that these prices have plummeted recently. The IEA projects it will come back to that nearly trillion dollar level, especially when you add in coal as well. And what we're seeing right now, we don't know quite what that means, if that's going to linger for a while. In fact, it may be a little bit of a preview of a disorderly transition away from fossil fuels. What we're seeing in communities from Nigeria to North Dakota. Uh, this is not the way we want to do it, the impacts we want to have on communities. And why that horse? Well, if you look at the NDCs, the, the nationally determined contributions that countries have made, there's not a single word about reducing the supply of fossil fuels. Countries continue to invest a trillion dollars, as you can see here, nearly a trillion dollars overall, supported by tens of billions of dollars of subsidies, tax breaks, and indirect support. Why are we still doing this today if we're committed? So it's very important as we do this, we've been looking at this phenomenon of carbon lock-in. And that's how investing in this fossil fuel infrastructure makes it harder to reach the targets we want to get. And it's not merely economic. It's also institutional, it's political, it's social. It's communities that depend upon it. How do we unlock that? It's a challenging issue that we're trying to get at. You see a picture of uh, an oil rig here. Today's news. If anybody caught it, Norway just opened up the Barents Sea to 13 new um, licenses for development. The oil minister says the oil potential is huge. Well, it turns out when we looked at this question of lock-in, the lock-in is greatest with offshore oil and other unconventional oil that costs a lot in capital to invest in, but once you've got it, you can produce it 20 to $30 a barrel for 20 to 30 years. So once we make that investment, it, it it's either gets stranded in an incredible waste or it locks us in to a future we don't want. But really, if we don't do that, somebody else is going to produce it, right? This has been the argument. 
across the world, right? We call this whack-a-mole game in the US. Knock it down here, it pops up somewhere else. Keystone XL pipeline. Who here has heard of the Keystone <laughs> XL pipeline? All right, that's most of you. A pipeline that would connect um, Alberta with the Gulf of Mexico and allow about 800,000 uh, barrels per day of potentially additional production from oil sands in Canada to reach the market. So we have a movement today, and it was really quite interesting. It's one of the biggest movements we've seen around climate involving um, civil society around this idea of stopping uh, investments like this. But is it purely a, a mobilization issue? Is there something that can be gained in terms of fossil fuel supply? We did a paper in Nature Climate Change that showed that, indeed, it's basic supply-demand economics. And if you look at the literature, it seems to suggest that for every barrel you leave in the ground, sure, a half a barrel will come back, but a half a barrel won't. And this adds up. It can be significant. And we brought this kind of logic to looking at what is a prominent political issue now in the US and policy issue, which is what do we do about federal lands? Turns out that a quarter of US fossil fuel production is on federal lands and waters. Now, what does this chart show? The chart shows that, you know, over, you know, until this boom in oil and gas, oh, fossil fuel was relatively flat. Now we're projected, even with a clean power plan, even amidst a national determined uh, uh, commitment to reduce 26 to 28 percent, the plan, the, the, the expectation is that fossil fuel production will increase overall 11 percent out to 2040. But if you look at this from a two degree and not even a 1.5 percent, 1.5 degree perspective, this needs to go down by half. There is an in incoherence here that we need to deal with. Is it perhaps ceasing to lease these lands? We looked at the impact of that, and those are those, those slices, the slice of yellow and blue at the top. That's what would potentially not be produced if we didn't continue to lease these lands, but maybe there are other policy mechanisms. We need to think about non-federal production as well. So is it worth acting on the supply side? Because we've been focusing on the demand side. Well, it turns out that now folks from around the world are doing things or thinking about supply-side interventions, and that's what we've been looking at. Can they be effective? Can they contribute? So the President Tong of Kiribati uh, announced the idea of a moratorium on new coal mines around the world. And it turned out soon thereafter, because of other reasons, oversupply in the market and other issues, or a review going on in the U.S. of our federal coal leasing program, there are these moratoria in the U.S. and China on new coal mines. And there are these strange bedfellows with this policy. It turns out that some incumbent producers kind of like the idea, reduces production. So are there ways to, to leverage that or to think about that? What's the right way to transition? So we're also looking at this question in emerging economies and coal producing and exporting economies that are dependent on this market. Because if we're serious about this transition and the demand dries up for coal, outside the country, what does it mean for communities in Colombia and Indonesia and elsewhere that are dependent upon that? How can we make this, help make this a just and orderly transition? So we're looking at those issues. I mean, I, here's the headline, from, uh, well, an article in today's Financial Times, a fix for a one-trick economy. Well, that's Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia has the resources. It could sell off 5% of Saudi Aramco and help to finance a transition. But what about other countries? And at the heart of this lies an equity issue. An equity issue, again, an incoherence related back to SDG 10, reducing inequalities. Uh, an equity issue that we really haven't begun talking about seriously. Who gets to, as Marion pointed out at the very beginning, produce the fossil fuels that remain? Because some of us have used up that space. And this is potentially an opportunity to develop if done well. So who has the most to lose? And we did a little analysis and we get to the short of it is that it turns out that what's on the margin between a two degree world and, and business as usual, a lot of that profit, all that extra money that could be plowed into communities is in places like Latin America, South and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, who haven't had the chance to develop their resources. Do we make room? Do we compensate them? So these are the kind of questions we're trying to investigate.
So we're having the first ever, we're convening the first ever international conference on these issues, fossil fuel supply and climate change policy, this September in Oxford. And we're trying to help build a community of researchers, policymakers, and others to think seriously about how we address things from the supply side as we're addressing things from the demand side from across the world. So, thank you so much. Okay, Marion, uh, Michael, thank you ever so much. Um, so I think that really, Marion, you really showed the, the urgent need that there is to um, be transforming our energy um, use and supply. Um, I quite like the, the, the idea of carbon entanglement and the fact that what we really need to do is be developing coherent policies both on the supply and the demand side that will hopefully move us away from that entanglement which is not putting us in a very good position at the moment. Okay, and then the final um, example that we're going to have is um, talking about finance, financing sustainable development. And for this, if I can welcome onto the stage um, Aaron Atteridge, um, from the SCI Stockholm Centre, and also Albert Salamanca from SCI Asia. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. So we'll round out this session on the good, the bad, and the ugly. <clears throat> With the good being Albert and I, we're going to highlight some of the bad and the ugly for you. So we're, what we're going to do is to talk about particular areas of incoherence in the way that finance connects to these common goals we've been discussing about sustainable development or climate change. I'll begin at the macro level, and Albert will then take us down to ground level and look at it from the perspective of developing countries. So we went, we're going to do this with about 10 uh, points of incoherence in finance as, as a, something for you to think about. The first one's probably obvious to most of you. There's analysis that, that shows that the emission pledges, or the kind of uh, mitigation pledges we've had so far, will maybe get us to around a three-degree world. Uh, and then the flip side of that is the adaptation finance that we have on the table so far maybe get us to about, adapt to about one and a half degrees. Uh, and these are both in UNEP emissions gaps and adaptation gap reports. Um, so the cost of adaptation compared to the amount of finance we have available, there's a big gap. And this, this creates a, a really big problem for us. It's sort of a, an incomplete equation because mitigation ambition plus adaptation finance is supposed to add up to safety for us. The second one, I was pleased to hear Charlotte talk about CEDA rethinking the delivery of, of development aid and development finance. Uh, and the second point of incoherence for us uh, we see is really between the needs of developing countries or their priorities and the way that finance is being delivered uh, either climate finance or development finance. Um, at, at present, we have a situation where, for various reasons, climate finance is being delivered separately from development finance, and this is having a distorting effect on the kinds of investments that it's being used for. So countries are being, and countries and donors, in fact, are being sort of encouraged to invest in things that look like climate change, flood prevention or irrigation, perhaps. But that may be not what developing countries most prioritize in terms of uh, setting themselves up for a long-term future where climate change is one important uh, uncertainty, which might be investments in health or education, for instance. You also have in this very complex architecture, global architecture of financial flows, uh, the problem of, as you can see, I mean, it's virtually impossible for at the bottom of that, that, that chart for a developing country government to align finance properly with its, with its real sustainable development priorities. Um, and also, it's, it's increasingly projectized, project, this, this kind of projectization of finance, meaning it comes in small, short-term parcels, and that's very difficult to connect to, to long-term transformation agendas. Uh, what might an alternative model look like? Well, I mean, we could, we could spend days trying to think about that. And one thing, if you can integrate climate change and disaster risk planning and SDGs international development planning, uh, maybe then you can sort of align finance better through the national development planning process. But there's no one perfect model. Okay, now we get to all the ones that I think are probably more interesting, uh, but no less important. If, if adaptation finance is supposed to be ensuring that we can adjust or, um, to, to or withstand future climate change, um, then it's, uh, it's really important that 
we understand what we're spending adaptation finance on. And so if, if, even if we don't feel a personal responsibility for the other species that, on the planet that we inhabit, uh, we're, our, our livelihoods and our prosperity is in, in, uh, intrinsically connected to them. So if you take the example of plants, this comes from the, the Kew, Kew Gardens did a, a State of the World's Plants report, which came out this year. And, and the red pictures indicate the different kind, how many plant species we depend on for different kinds of uses, so foods, fuels, med medicines, uh, poisons, fibers, so on. Um, so it's a, a very concrete example of the way in which our, our prosperity and our livelihood depends on uh, the adaptation of natural ecosystems. And so then we might expect to see in, in this expenditure of adaptation finance quite a significant chunk going on adaptation for biodiversity, for instance, uh, which, is, which is not happening. And if that continues, I think it's a very big, very big problem for us. Uh, the last one was just to show you that from the same report, um, more than 10% of the Earth's vegetated surface is highly sensitive to climate variability. Uh, I was also uh, listening when Charlotte said that uh, the private sector, I mean, we can't expect them to be a charity, so they only get involved when, when, when it's in the business for them. Um, and it turns out that investments in sustainable development or climate activities in, in particularly the least developing countries don't appear to be very good business for them. Um, so we see an incoherence between the increasing rhetoric around private finance, um, filling the investment gaps and helping us to make this transition to sustainable development and, and cl uh, climate, our climate goals, um, and the sort of investment patterns that are actually experienced by least developed countries and small island developing states in particular. So some years ago, SCI did, looked at the sort of, uh, foreign direct investment and international bank lending patterns. Um, and, and it's no surprise, perhaps, to see that most foreign direct investment goes to upper middle income countries. Uh, and, and where it does, the little bit that does get to least developed countries connects with natural resource extraction, usually. If you think about the sectors that might be key from, a, from an SDG perspective, like agriculture, for instance, most FDI in agriculture goes to a very large industrial scale agriculture and to cash crops rather than food staples. If you think about the tourism sector, most of it goes to large hotels. Um, if you think about water, I mean, outside of East Asia, there's very little private investment in, water, in the water sector um, and so on. So, I mean, and there's virtually no evidence of investment in, in uh, education and health sectors, uh, for instance. So that's a very worrying trend. Um, what it perhaps does mean is that we need to start thinking about this a little bit differently and um, how do we mo allow greater mobilization of finance within um, the least developed countries, which is either strengthening tax collection systems, lowering the transaction costs for remittances, uh, as a couple of examples stimulating the domestic private sector. Uh, this slide is only to show you that um, you, we, can, we can look just at the inflow side, if you like, but it's also important to think about what money is coming out of countries. And for some, uh, particularly the LDCs, again, there's more money coming out of the country through debt repayments, illicit financial flows. So it's also a, increases that problem for them. OK, now we get to one of, one of the, what I think are actually two elephants in the finance room. One is... Um, between, there's an incoherence between the incentives um, and structure of the financial sector itself and these global goals that we've been talking about. Or put differently, is there's an in incoherence in the expectation that green finance, if you like, um, is supposed to change the trajectory of development when it has to compete with a much larger volume of brown finance. Um, and this is just an example to sh from Carbon Tracker to show the, the amount of uh, asset investment that is within the world's major stock exchanges that is uh, connected to fossil fuels now. And it's just a way of showing that th there are these deep structural incentives in the global investment system that keep patterns of brown finance uh, much larger than green finance. Uh, and another example is that, you know, just between 2013 and 2014, the amount of bank financing for coal mining went up 20%. Uh, the good news is there are things like uh, green bonds being talked about, an emerging trend of you know, a, a, a different instrument for raising funds for sustainable development or climate-related activities. There are divestment campaigns going on where you have major institutional investors like pension funds pledging to pull finance out of particular co uh, fossil fuel 
fossil, fossil fuel sectors. Um, NSCI is about to do some work to look into those, those emerging trends. Um, but there's, at the same time as you have this, there's another worrying trend, which is the overall stability of the global financial system. So if you have analysts talking about, worry, worried about, for instance, um, rising debt levels, you know, bubbles within the, within the financial system, this poses a real risk to sort of the long-term availability of finance for the kinds of goals we're talking about. And lastly, the other elephant, which was mentioned before, is there's an incoherence between tax policy and this recognition that we need more money for, for the, tackling climate risks. The Guardian was reporting that climate, um, offshore finance siphons more than 12 trillion out of emerging economies alone. Um, and just this, this uh, was a great quote, I think, just charging 1% tax on this siphoned wealth is equivalent to global ODA budgets. So it's, it's fairly significant. And with that, I'll hand over to Albert. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, the next set of co in policy incoherence are based on discussions and conversations uh, we had with uh, local stakeholders in Asia. The first set of incoherence is between urgency and responsibility. We understand that the, the threat of climate change is urgent, but the funds available to help countries in the region to adjust to the impacts of climate change are not really that easy to access. They need to demonstrate what they call as fiduciary responsibility. So in Asia right now, the only national implementing entity for the Adaptation Fund is the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development of India. The Indonesia Climate Change Trust Fund tried to apply, they failed, because they couldn't demonstrate fiduciary responsibility. Among the things that's being required, for example, they have to have whistleblower policies, they need to have gender policies, among other, other policies that are required by the funds to be able to be accredited as a national implementing entity. So again, the threat is urgent, but the funds are not really easily accessible. I remember a conversation I had with a Department of Finance official who came to a workshop in Bangkok who said, in the Philippines, we were able to access loans from the World Bank, from the IMF, and we get five times investment upgrades, but we couldn't even get an adaptation funding. And if I may remind you, the Philippines is one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world, but funds are not really that available. Last week, we organized a workshop for SIDA, and in one of the conversations in, during the workshop, one partner said, it's interesting because uh, the Green Climate Fund is based on the adaptation fund framework. L largely, it's learning from that particular implementation of the adaptation fund because it's, it happens much earlier. And one of the things that they really required all the proponents to have is gender policy. But they've said, looking at the 24 board members, of the Green Climate Fund, only four are women. So another set of incoherence between need and accountability. Much of the forms of accountability that's really happening in, the, in, in climate financing are more upward looking. They're more to satisfy the demands of the different donors and their governments. But the accountability is not meant to address the needs of the beneficiaries, whom the financing are supposed to help them, but their needs are not there. Another one is between the global and the local. So again, this relates to the previous one. It needs to be linked to what's really happening globally. But the appreciation of what's really happening globally is, di is different from what's the appreciation among communities on, 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 on the problems. Because for them, there are far more urgent problems that they encounter. So while climate change is important, there are urgent issues that they need to contend with. So in the case, for example, of adaptation funds, they think that issues, locally based issues, are procurement issues. That's why they have to ensure that the fiduciary responsibilities are being executed or available 
with the national implementing entities so that they will be able to respond to local needs. But again, to be able to develop a proposal that's worth millions of dollars, it's something that communities are not, don't have access to. They're not in that position really to, for the problems that they encounter to have huge amounts of money. And I don't think, and I'm sure you agree, that it's not also really possible for communities to, de to devise the solutions or the proposals that's being required by these funds so that they can access them. Finally, there is also this incoherence between the norm of promoting gender equality and the way this is being operationalized. So, in the Green Climate Fund, the, the climate financing had to respond to the needs of the underrepresented, especially women. But according to an experience of a preparation facility for adaptation financing based in Bangkok, much of those policies really involves a lot of box checking. In other words, they're not meaningful and productive. So, this year and in the coming years, SEI Asia and my colleagues, through the Climate Finance Initiative, will develop tools and approaches on how we can bring in meaningful engagement with gender in climate finance. And just to tell you a bit about this picture, this is a picture taken in, in a floating village in Cambodia. So notice the woman registering the business of the day while the men are playing cards. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed, um, Aaron and Albert. Um, I know that we're running a little bit short on time, so I think I will directly hand over to our director, <laughs> um, Johan Schulenschirner, without whom probably none of this would be very possible. So over to you, Johan. Wow, that's a nice introduction. Thank you very much. How do you feel? Good. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, are you feeling energized? How many feel now that after this pr these presentations you are more optimistic about the fact that we will achieve the SDGs, then you were at 1.30. Okay, how many feel more pessimistic? And a lot of people don't feel anything at all. That's okay. Uh, we have a lot of questions though. I, you know, traditionally, uh, researchers tend to end up with additional questions and problems and challenges, but I hope at least many of you can see that in SCI, we are really trying to also bridge into science and provide answers and so on. But then there are many difficult answers to be, to be really delivered. And what do you do then? You invite a panel. <laughs> so you don't have to answer them yourself. So I will invite the panel and I will do something directly after they come up that they're not aware of. They think they will have you know, very comfortable questions coming from me and, and so on. But actually I will reach out to you and give, take two, three minutes to, you know, throw in a couple of comments or questions, really short, uh, so they can actually respond a little bit to them also in their answers that they will also give to my questions. So, you know, a little bit more dynamic here. Can I ask all the four panelists to come up and then I will introduce them. Where is my, f yes, please. Can you hang around one table or do you need two tables or how do you feel? Is we it too tight? A, we should have a round table. A round table. Well, Pick stand table. around here so you can, yeah, exactly. So, so. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, first of all, Minister Christina Passion. Hello. She's the Minister for Strategic Development and Nordic Cooperation, a very interesting mm -hmm. portfolio. You will get an applaud in a second, but I think I introduce <laughs> all four first. We have Eva Blixt, uh, Research Director at the Swedish Conf uh, Confederation of Steel Industries, uh, Jan Konturet. Yes. We have Matthias Goldman, uh, he's the CEO of Forest, which is an independent uh, think tank. And actually this year, or actually last year, or is it this, this year? year? It's this year actually, but it's probably for things you did last year. Uh, I, who cares? <laughs> he's the most uh, environmentally powerful person in Sweden, so just so you know. So if uh, no one else can answer, I will... <laughs> Go to wow. you. You see that? Yeah, this is a shock. <laughs> yeah. And then we have um, 
Anna Borgerid, who is chair of the board at Polarbröd and also a co-owner. This is a family company. Uh, and Polarbröd is very well known in Sweden. Anyone who is a tourist here or foreigner here, buy a package when you actually leave Ooh. the country. So, now we give them an applause and feel welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this is sort of academia, think tank, science, policy, and action in terms of the private sector. So we have a very, very competent panel. No one is playing card, not even you, Matthias, on this one. <laughs> Let me check now very quickly. Any, any reactions from the, this afternoon? Can you, you know, anyone? Yes, please. So we have a microphone. Quickly who you are, and then a quick reaction. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Annette Anderson. I work at ACB. Uh, I have a question for you, Christina. Uh, France are putting in some severe environmental laws, actually, mm -hmm. regarding uh, food waste and emissions. Uh, what do the Swedish government think about these things? Okay. That's good. They will come back. You keep it in mind, and then you can integrate it in your answer. That's to keep you awake. Anyone else? <laughs> Only the banking sector has questions. We have one here also. I'm Fabien Midman, UN Habitat. I have a question uh, directly to the minister. Um, I, I attended recently a seminar with India, uh, the India Days, and uh, one of the suggestions was, of course, urbanization of India. When do Sweden, when, when is Sweden going to make a package for urbanization through its development aid with the help of the researchers at SEI and make these solutions profitable for both Sweden, the environment, and all of us? Thank you. Okay. So, international collaboration. Anyone else having a comment uh, upstairs. We have a microphone oh, yeah. there as well. There's one over there, no? There's only a microphone there. <laughs> Anyone? My, yes, please, that's good. One there? Okay, one there and one there, and then we move to the panel. Thanks, Toby Gunn, the um, Stockholm Environment Institute. A few of the panelists this afternoon have commented on how incredibly ambitious the SDG agenda is and the fact that we only have 15 years, and we've just heard a whole series of presentations as to how incoherent our current architecture and infrastructure, political, social, economic, financial, really is. And it would be great to hear from the whole panel a candid appraisal as to whether they really feel optimistic that we can overcome the, the disconnect between the ambition and the capacity that we have at the moment. Exactly. So actually, I really expect the panel to have solved all this in half an hour. That's the critical question. Then we take the final one here, please. So these are inputs. Don't feel that you immediately have to respond to them, but integrate answers, please. Uh, Lennart Båge, Global Utmaning. Uh, I heard Per Bolen make a very passionate presentation and plea for the work in Sweden uh, by the government and by the delegation for the Agenda 2030. What will you, and I'm not looking at the minister, because she's been part of preparing this, but I'm looking at the think tank and the private sector and, uh, and Jan Contour. What will you do to be part of Sweden's combined effort to walk the walk, as he said, to implement Agenda 2030 in Sweden? Good, excellent. Thank you very much. Now you know a little bit about the thinking going on in the room uh, after this afternoon and, and <laughs> questions that are really easy to answer. So I'm, I'm not worried at all. Christina, if I can move to you, and, and a very open question. We have heard about the ambitions uh, from Per Bolen earlier today. You are also, and he also said that you are one of the key ministers in this, uh, in this work also, looking at more the long term, of course, you know, strategic development. Uh, what, from your perspective, looking at your issues, are key actions to take in order to move the SDGs into action in Sweden? In Sweden and in and international and in the whole world, there is only one thing that is of absolutely key importance, and that is 
the right governance, that you have the governance that build the institutions, decide the laws, introduce the tax systems, and stop the uh, f subsidies to the fossil industries, and introduce the uh, CO2 taxes, and you do all the right things to get the right incentives and right institutions so that we can succeed with the green transformation. Mm. And at the same time, of course, modernize our e industries and create employment and create uh, sustainable welfare citizens at the same time. Because if not, if we don't manage this challenge, we will never manage to keep our societies healthy and economically sustainable either. Mm. It, everything goes together. It is integrated. And the agenda is transformative. And it, we, we really must get governance right in the world. If you look at Sweden, then, I mean, the, the responsibility of the government, uh, if you say from zero to 100%, how far has Sweden come in that transformation? Well, the Swedish government has a very ambitious agenda. We have the goals, the goal of becoming one of the first fossil-free welfare uh, countries in the world. And uh, we have the uh, goal to uh, also, within 20 years, have a 100% fossil-free energy system. Electricity shall be produced by only fossil-free methods and nuclear-free. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, renewable energy, mm. 100%. And uh, we also have seven parties behind the goal so to uh, um, achieve in 2045 uh, carbon neutrality. Mm. So that's the whole party system, you could say, is behind that goal. But of course, lots remains to be done. I mean, the transport system, consumption-wise, we are not achieving very well. I mean, we are from the production side, we are doing, com in comparison mm. with other countries, quite well. But from the consumption side, we are one of the, uh, the criminals in the world. Mm. We are on number 10 in the world in uh, carbon dioxide emissions coming from Swedish consumption mm. in the world. And what, I mean, just saying, I mean, because quite often I hear also internationally, if, you know, if Sweden can't do this, who can and all this. Yeah, well, I agree. So, but <laughs> what, what, is, uh, what are the main obstacles then in Sweden? Why don't you just, uh, just like some companies are saying, just do it? Well, yeah, it's governance again. I mean, we need to get a system of working within government mm. that really has this long-term holistic view and, and, and have this cross-sectorial approach and mm. focus in our decision-making. And we must do it much quicker. Yeah. We know it and we try, but, but it's, rather, it's a system that is rather slow in, in changing. And um, we are organized according to a vertical principle. But we are talking about the necessity of having horizontal mm. processes mm. and moving fast. Mm. And, um, well, uh, this is, I, I'm happy for the agenda because the agenda 2030 gives us this platform uh, and legitimacy to push for these changes in Sweden and also in the world at large. So it gives us a reason to interact with the world around us, to exchange uh, experiences and views and to help others and get help from others. Mm. So I am very hopeful that the agenda will play an important and very uh, constructive role in this uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. And just very, very quickly on the question from our uh, colleague from the SCB, do we need tougher laws? Uh, what, you know, what kind of uh, key actions do we need to take in Sweden? Is this, is this the way forward as they do in France? Well, yeah, we, we need the right rules and legislations mm -hmm. so that, for instance, the transport system will transform uh, rapidly enough and uh, we need to adjust, of course, uh, together with the rest of the world, mm. uh, how the, the, the uh, tax system is constructed. We need to have a, a changes with how the, the tax system will support the green transformation and also uh, a more um, employment-friendly uh, economy. Mm. So there's a lot of systemic changes that need to take place. That's great. And maybe come back a little bit later, but, but you're working across the entire government. It would be interesting yeah. to get your insights uh, if you have <laughs> ministries who are more or less working with or against you. But we can come back to that a little bit later. I don't know how much you want to share with us on this, um, but anyway. Um, 
Eva Blixt, um, talking about transformative changes and also, you know, in terms of uh, what are you going to do about it? You are coming from uh, an industry in Sweden, which uh, not always have been seen as being at you know, a front runner. We've had a uh, pleasure to work together with you over the last almost two years, more or less. And, and now you have suddenly, you know, an industry which is really trying to move very, very fast in a way. What, what was the trigger for that? How did you get, how did you manage, Eva? How did we manage? Well, we, is it working? It's working, okay. Yes. I think we get tired of being the, the bad, the ugly and the elephant <laughs> in the room. Because the thing in the industry, the steel industry is not known for saying yes, the steel industry is known for saying no, we don't want that, we don't want this, we don't... So we thought, instead of being a, a no-sayer, start to say what do we want and what do we need from the society, what do we need from the government to make this happen. The, we didn't have the sustainable development goal at that time, but 2013 we did a vision for us called Steel Shapes a Better Future. And steel is really necessary for the society. You don't know how much steel we are using every year. It's 1.5 billion tons of steel every year today. And that is before all the SDGs is fulfilled. If we take the people out of poverty, we will need more steel. Or if we use Swedish steel, we will need less because it's much more efficient. But that's uh, <laughs> for the commercial. Uh. So, but anyway, we started to, to, to two years, five years ago actually, to think we have to tell what we want to do and we have to try to attract people to help us to do what we want. And that's why this, this actually is for 2050. So steel shapes a better future mm. to 2050. And it's quite easy uh, uh, commitments in that. Uh, the first one is very necessary. We have to lead the technology uh, development to be able to stay in Sweden because it's, it's expensive to be here. But if we are doing qualified steel, then we can stay here. So we always have to lead the technical development. The other one is to attract the most clever, the most uh, competent people to our sector who want to work in the steel industry. We are the elephant, the ugly and the bad. <laughs> so we have to tell the story that steel shapes a better future and steel is necessary 2050 also because we want windmills, we want railways, we want bridges and, and houses. But then the, the last ultimate uh, commitment that was really, really strong from our CEOs, it's the CEOs in the steel companies who have had these three mm. commitments. It says that we should have all our output brings value to the society. All output. That means not only the steel, we should have all the outputs that brings value for the society. It means no waste, no emissions to air and water, and no CO2. And that's really a challenge for the biggest uh, sector in Sweden to say, well, we, 2050, we, we try to solve this. We won't have any CO2 emissions. Um, and this project and this vision and the project we have together with you have started this, um, actually taking actions mm. uh, on this. And maybe I should come back to that later. Maybe come back a little bit. I mean, what, what is interesting, I mean, we have talked a lot about consumption, I mean, these kind of things. We haven't talked so much about behavioral change, actually. And here you are talking about the complete sector who changed their behavior to a certain extent. H how did you get, I mean, I met these uh, steel CEOs. They are, you know, they're a bunch of guys, uh, really. <laughs> Um, how, do you, how, how, do you, how do you make them move from, as you said, you know, being, uh, you know, we, I, we don't want to touch this, to actually, you know, really believing in this and, and, and dare, dare to take these steps forward? The thing is that in the sector, when we are meeting each other, we know how excellent Swedish steel is. It's a, it's a really high uh, quality steel, making a lot of changes. And, and when you use it, it's, it's lighter, it's thinner. So when we use it, we are sure that the CO2 emissions will be lower. And the process in Sweden are more environmental friendly than the other one. But we only tell each other that. And then we decided maybe we should talk to other and tell the story, because that's about storytelling, mm. isn't it? And, and the, the power of, of this vision and the three commitments, especially the ones 
that we should only have uh, products that is valuable for the society. That was really starting this process for the CEOs, but also for the, the employed people in the mm. sector. But anyway, I mean, you talk about 2050, and this uh, takes me really directly to Matthias, because in his uh, uh, interview, when he became this extremely powerful person, or, or selected this uh, person, he said any coward could set ambitious targets uh, 2045. Um, okay, can I have a comment on that? <laughs> you will have a chance. <laughs> I don't want to be coward. I, uh, yeah, but I want to hear yeah. his, uh, you know, wh what did you mean by that? Became, because it came very late in the article and, and suddenly it was just there and they didn't explain it. So now explain it to us. What do, what do you mean by that? You know, at the, t at the time, I thought I was being provocative. Yeah. But then it turned out I was just uh, predicting the future. Because what we have is seven parties. Yeah, we're being super resource efficient here. We're four person sharing glass. How about that? <laughs> but because then we had seven parties saying 2045, Sweden is going to be fossil independent. And, and then that sort of ambition and that oh, guy's angles, who are really tough, it evaporates into thin air when we see that they're very soon going to deliver the million months loaded. They're going to deliver the 2030 targets. We know, and we're trying to push them as much as we can, and we need help from each and every one of you. But we know that they're not even going to suggest, it seems, a fossil independent transport sector that seven parties have agreed on before. Mm. So we see that, yes, everyone can be tough 2045, 2050, but only the real tough guys and girls who are made of steel can be <laughs> tough also in the intermediate targets. And that's what we need, because we can't, as much as I believe in the ketchup effect, we can't be fundamentalist in believing that the ketchup effect is going to fix everything in the last few years. That's not going to be possible. Uh, since you are so excited, Eva, uh, <laughs> when the steel industry is excited, then you're not just let. What is it that just, you want no, to... I, I just want to say something about this investments, because it's about business. We're on yeah. the business box. And for steel sector, we do an investment in furnaces that may be prolonged for 50, 60 years. Mm. And this investment is done for a blast furnace that is the one who's making the CO2 emissions. And until 2050, there is only one switch of new technology. We, ha we, doesn't, we can't do a lot of different steps. So that's okay. why to have this from now on to 2050, there we can have one, one shot. We have to decide, should we have uh, hydrogen uh, furnaces or should we continue with a uh, blast furnace and CCS? So that's why we are not cowards. We are realistic here. <laughs> <laughs> realistic. By Just the way, I mean, talking about thin air going up in thin air and so on, I mean, as you said, we had a very ambitious target about uh, 2030 fossil free uh, transport sector. You have a lot of really insights into the uh, transport sector. At least what I hear, we sell more uh, fossil cars than ever before, more or less. I mean, what, 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 why is this happening? What is your, your assessment of this? Well, you know, Christina is a wise person, and she's absolutely right that it's all about policy. So we've got seven parties that agree in theory that this should happen. But when I go to the bank and say, hey, I want to borrow some money here because I want to put up a biogas plant, a biodiesel plant, electricity for heavy-duty transport, they say, okay, what is, how, are, how are you sure? that this is going to be lucrative. And then I say, well, seven of them parties agree. And then they say, well, show me the legislation. And I say, well, they didn't actually do that. So we don't get any investment. And we know that oil is ah. cheaper than ever before. And we see now that the reduction of CO2 emissions in Sweden is not what it used to be. We're, we're lagging when we need to show leadership. In the exact time when we signed Paris, and now we've got to move into ratification and move into actually doing things, Sweden that we're saying, we're going to be the first country doing this, the first country doing that. And that's also really the only way Sweden can make sense. Mm. As a small country, things that we do, they don't matter unless we do them so well that other countries say, hey, we want to learn from Sweden. We should be sort of the global help desk for other countries and starting, starting with the transport, so stuff that you're doing at the SEI. We should start with one sector because we can't be best in all sectors. Really, we can't. And the transport sector is the most logical for us because we've got very many very important transport sector mm. uh, initiatives and companies. And when we do that, others will say, hey, if Sweden can, we can too. But if we lose momentum now, the whole world will lose momentum. Mm. Uh, we, but we learned in SI, Swedes 
do not have all the answers. So we have 55 nationalities in SCI now trying. Oh to, yeah. You know, but uh, Anna Borjerud, if I can move over to you, you, you don't. You, I mean, in your company, it's it's a family-owned company, which means that basically you can do whatever you want. Uh, you don't need to wait for you know the stock market or banks, whatever. But you are also. I mean, what is interesting? You are quite provocative in terms of uh, discussing sustainability, and and you think, if I understand you correctly, that we are thinking still far too much in linear, mm -hmm. linear thinking and so on. Can you tell us a little bit about how you have made this transition in the company and you are still very profitable? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was, I'm going to connect that answer also uh, yes. to the gentleman over here who asked, what are we doing? Um, I would say that we are working in three areas, one of which is what you're alluding to, um, the rebuilding of the way we provide for ourselves. And here is what I would call the biggest elephant in the room <laughs> and uh, incoherence problem with the Agenda 2030 goals, and that is the issue of economic growth. And the fact that so much of what we have already built, just as you exemplified, mm -hmm. uh, is unsustainable. It is putting us over dangerous thresholds. And that means that we also need to talk about degrowth. We need to talk about <coughs> closing things down. And uh, the three areas uh, we're working with in terms of the first, as I told you, rebuild the way we provide for ourselves. We, um, being part of the fifth generation at the helm of uh, Sweden's third largest bakery, we were lucky to inherit an um, electricity-driven uh, factory, so it's three bakeries, and we uh, could decide to invest 150 plus million kronor in building four wind turbines, which now provide as much electricity to the, the Swedish uh, electricity net as we need for the bakeries. So that was one of the four goals that we have put for 2022, Matthias. I'm not calling you a coward. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and we check on that. Renewable energy, uh, we reached the finishing line in February last year. Now we have three more areas to go. Uh, transportation. Uh, which we, we want to be renewably powered. Uh, we have uh, uh, plastics, you know, the bags we put our bread in, which is fossil-based, obviously, uh, plastic is. And uh, thirdly, uh, the biggest problem for entire, the entire civilization, which is the food supply, agriculture. Even though bread is among the best things you can eat in terms of climate and, and environment, we found that we, our biggest impact is in the, mm. in the, 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 the you know, from the wheat and things that we use for, to make the bread. And here we have a linear problem because so much of the, of the wealth and prosperity that it, we currently enjoy in the world is based on cheap food. And this cheap food is in turn based on a linear production system. And we talk too, far too little about this. Mm. Uh, we need to make agriculture circular again. And this will mean that it is not, probably not going to be this cheap. And we also need to connect many sectors, like for instance, we are 350 people in the north of Sweden. How can we have sustainable sourced wheat if we have an uh, infrastructure which is built on linear use of nutrition, nutrients. Um, what about sewage? What about uh, putting the, 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 you know, the natrium and phosphorus ba back, back again on the soils and things like that? So, so we need to cooperate with most, more, much, most, the most sectors, actually. And um, politicians will be a huge part. How can we legislate to support the transition? It's, it's a big question. The other two areas that we, uh, we work in is um, networking and public affairs, trying to speak to all of you and, and uh, telling you about the lessons we've learned. We have this network of, of um, businesses that work according to the, uh, the frame conditions of the natural step. How many in this room know about the natural step and the frame conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. 
40% perhaps, that's good. Uh, we have a network of businesses that work according to this, and we have made a um, call for future fit governance, which is saying basically that we, we can already be profitable by moving strategically to full sustainability, because we can use this process based on, on science, and we know what full sustainability is. But the transition is too slow, and we need to have more support from, uh, in order to be fast enough uh, legislation and the, and the rules of the game. Somebody talked about the mm. rules of the game. Obviously, the economic rules of the game are not coherent, co consistent with um, Resor uh, uh, sustainable resource mm. management. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this mess. Mm. So these things mm. is something that we're trying to work to, to put the light on. How do we change the rules of the game? And there are also this struggle going on, like the TTIP, uh, which is uh, threatening to, to move in the wrong direction, because if we have good leg legislation in Sweden, and then we, we get sued by some multinational corporate actor that finds that... Um, oh, she needs a new mic. <laughs> uh, so, 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 and the third one is that we need... We live in a story. Yeah. Do, 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 keep it short, so, because... Okay, yes, yes. You, you, I, 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 okay. Um, we live in a story. We need to change the story. So I'm also working in trying to be part of this new story and in... Uh, as your keynote speaker said, arts and humanities. I wrote a novel about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's good. So you can read a book if you want to have the full story. Yes. Exactly. But uh, Christina, if I can move back to you, I asked you a nasty question, but I, I will soften it. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you want to say who are difficult, mm -hmm. that's okay in terms of the ministries. As you said, we are working in different silos, and you work across the whole. How do, how do you motivate different powers, you could say, in, <laughs> in, a, in a government to really move in the same direction? Because, uh, okay, we talked about policy coherence, Mons talked about policy coherence, but we, we are likely to keep different ministries around for quite some time. <laughs> so how can we work within the system to still move in the same direction? How do you motivate that? Well, the Prime Minister motivates us all mm. by formulating the ambitions and also the agenda. Well, we are behind the agenda. Mm. And this is also uh, something that the whole government must work together to achieve. And uh, by the, the means of following up and also uh, telling uh, the society, the citizens of Sweden and the outside world, by formulating these, these ambitions, we get the pressure. We formulate the pressure for ourselves. So we motivate ourselves. Um, we need to work in a different way. Agenda 2030 demands a different way of working mm. in Sweden. We need to formulate uh, um, organize our work more in a, the sense of horizontal processes. And my role is not to implement the goals as such. Mm. That is the finance ministry that will do that. And uh, my, go my, my, uh, my role is to, to investigate and to an analyze, uh, do the analysis and to show how we, what we must do in order to reach the goals. Mm -hmm. And this I will do together with the, uh, the other ministries, of course. And we are organizing it right now. We are having meetings with other ministries and talking with them. And, and I have meetings continuously with my colleagues, and, and we will discuss this. Mm -hmm. And I agree, it's 15 years is a very, very short yeah, time. Exactly. And a very ambitious agenda. But for Sweden, happily enough, we have come pretty far in many instances. I think we have an important role to, do, to work with other con uh, countries as mm. well in order to transmit experiences, transfer experience to them and to help the processes in other countries. Mm. I just came back from, from Africa and, and there's so much we can do together with others and at the same time change our ways of transporting ourselves so that we reach the goal of 2030 mm. with a tra fossil free transport system as well. What do you say, Matthias? Uh, do you think uh, also what, uh, what Christina is saying, that okay, we are now assessing how we are set up and we need to change to adapt or to be able to, uh, to address the Agenda 2030? Is this realistic, you think? I, I think it is, but, but, and I totally concur with what Christina is saying, but I took note when our beloved Prime Minister Levin was signing 
the 23rd agreement, uh, the development goals. Then he immediately said Sweden's focus is access to clean water in developing countries. Mm. And for me, that's a no, no, no. First of all, <laughs> we cannot allow mm. to focus on just one of these goals. That's not allowed. Second of all, it's not just for developing countries, it's for all countries. Third of all, it's not for the prime ministers to decide which targets are focused. We should decide that together. So I concur with you, but your prime minister has a different okay, agenda. I'll have and I'm a sad. Word with him, okay. Please do that. Good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Eva, if I can move back to you, I mean, I know you're burning to say something about <laughs> now taking this forward because, okay, we are hearing that even in the government, of course, that this agenda will shape things and, uh, you know, probably two years from now we will go from, I don't know how many ministries, to maybe three only, mm, you know, and okay. can, can be complete transformation in this. We're going to look so much forward to that. <laughs> anyway, but... What about um, the steel industry then? Okay, you've had this process. Uh, again, a major sector. What kind of actions have you proposed there? More investigations or real action? Oh, uh, uh, this is working now? Yes. Perfect. I have two microphones now, so I will talk for ages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to make a little bit, uh, things a little bit more complicated for, for, for government, maybe. Mm -hmm. it, it, the steel industry, SSAB, is prepared to do steel without having any CO2 emission yeah. at all. That's great. Instead of using a blast furnace and coke, they will use uh, another furnace and hydrogen. Mm. Mm. And uh, then we get steel and water from the process. Steel and water only. And that is Elkoebi, El that's the mining company. SSAB, that's the steel company. And it's Vattenfall, it's a state-owned energy company. Launched we know Vattenfall, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't know if I should say it. But anyway, this is, for me, a private company works together with two state-owned companies trying to solve this issue because if we want to change the process making steel and water we need so much more electricity today we use five terawatts electricity for the blast mm -hmm. furnace and the coke if we should do this we need 20 mm -hmm. terawatts mm -hmm. and we are happy to do this transformation doing the investments mm -hmm. in the furnace mm -hmm. but and this is a big big but the state and the government needs to be prepared to invest a huge amount of how to collect sunshine to hydrogen, mm -hmm. how to do the electrolysis, mm -hmm. how to storage, and how to use, and, how, and, and there is lots of questions. Yeah. On energy research, not, it's not, mm -hmm. I mean, and if we are agreeing on the Agenda 20 uh, development, I don't know, the, Global Agenda goals. Yeah. I don't know anymore. They changed name. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, if we're agreeing that we should take people out of poverty and we shouldn't have any CO2 emissions, then we have to decide what to do. And mm. this is a way forward. But we have mm. to agree upon that this is the Swedish way forward. Together, the public and the private mm. sector together. And then SSAB, LKAB and Vattenfall is prepared mm. to do investments, but there is a lot of infrastructure investments to be done. Yeah. And if we don't talk about these bigger questions, only focusing on one goal, and I do agree to Matthias, we can't pick one, we have to have them all there, then we won't succeed. Mm. But this is really, and it's not possible to do until 2030, because it's a lot of investments, so it's 2045 for us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So both, both, uh, I mean both uh, Anna and Eva are saying that we need to really have you know, partnerships. You, you can do a lot mm -hmm. of things within the private mm -hmm. sector. Uh, you also talk about transformation, really. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, basically, you're also talking about transformation. So, uh, mm -hmm. Christina, before I go to you, Matthias, because mm -hmm. I know you want to comment on this, but Christina, I mean, is that, is that a key role of the government, to really listen in now and, and be prepared to make major infrastructure investments and so on? And where will the money come from? Well. There's no shortage of money. Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> only, only the, oh, it's only the Minister of Finance <laughs> who says, but in the private sector, there it got. <laughs> you have a lot of money in the private sector. Ah, okay. You have to find the means, the ways and means to channel the private sector capital in the private market, the capital markets, to sustainable goals to, to uh, de development for the society. And that is a big, big challenge that how can, we are how working can we do, on. Yeah, but how can we, do you have an idea there? What well, do you think? I, yeah. I know as, you as was said earlier, there is a development taking place. There is an in in interest within the financial institutions to get involved in the green bonds, 
to change the way they work, to disinvest, to, and we should interact with this, Per Boland and I. We have uh, both um, uh, contributed to um, a role in uh, the G20 uh, finance group, study group for green finance. And uh, the G20 has another study group that is about climate finance. So there is a growing interest in the world uh, as a whole for uh, participating mm. in a change, in this change. The only big problem is the speed, mm. that we need to move much more rapidly. But when the market sense that there is the future, is different, the future is green, then it will adapt mm. quicker. But we need to have the right incentives on that place. And uh, I, uh, I feel that um, there is, uh, what we must do is of course to have partnerships. We must work with business, with the industry. We must have joint uh, research and innovation programs. And we must uh, have a dialogue all the time in order to achieve these uh, goals. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope you all tweeted also that there is no shortage of money <laughs> <laughs> in the Swedish government. That's great. But Matthias and then Anna, what, what do you if, think? If, if some of us believe that some people might think that there is a shortage of money, mm -hmm. then I think it might make sense to spend that money wisely. And then I totally concur with Eva that the way the government is currently spending its climate money is efficient in terms of the maximum number of press releases we can get for every million dollars, because we want to give you a little bit, and you a little bit, and you a little bit, so that every municipality can have a few lad stalled by charging points for electric cars. But if we really want to make a change, something that makes other countries look, and something that can really mean that Sweden as a small country does define something, then we need to say, okay, we're going to go all in in a few select tra sectors. I said transport, she says the, the steel industry. I think those might be the two where we can really make a difference. But to put a little bit everywhere means we're never going to be the global leader that we that is the only point for us to do anything in climate. Just too much dut economy. Too much dut <laughs> and too much focus on those damn press releases. Okay. What, but what do you think we should do about it then? I mean, is it, well, how can we... How can we get it is done and over. Focus on a few issues the way we can really make a change. Say, okay, steal. That's the thing. And say we've got a seven-party agreement on a fossil independent transport sector. Let's go to legislation and let's give the right incentives and let's let back cost what we need to yeah. do to actually get there. But in the in industry, may I just <laughs> comment? Uh, there's 12 industries in Sweden, 12 industries in Sweden that account for 70% of all the emissions from the industry. And the industry accounts for something like 20, up to 20%. <laughs> Keep <Okay. picking>. <laughs> <laughs> Up to 20% of the total emissions in Sweden. So it's 12 companies actually that we need to address and work with in order to reduce the emissions from the industry. That's my argument. Stop doing stupid things like yeah, climate, yeah. leave it and focus on those. Well, Anna. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I agree with you, Matthias, no, but mostly, but one thing, I don't think we should choose just a few things and, and leave the other things by, because we will need sustainable food supply will be very crucial. Sure. I think that when these sectors become tighter, I think we will realize the, 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 the role that food plays in health, Peace, uh, peace, and uh, and uh, orderness, orderly, you know, policy making or, or climate, and uh, also refugees stream, streams and things like that. But I would say one thing we can go ahead and do, which would be my dream, is that we, if we could get the governance right and mm -hmm. and make the rules of the game, because the answer is to. I think is to tap into market power. Hmm. If we would have a true market economy, which we do not have today, things market forces would help us. If we have true cost pricing, hmm. we would not be able to spend our money uh, on unnecessary, very you know, environmentally stupid things because they would be quite expensive. We would rearrange the way we pr prioritize and, and uh, live. So I think until we have true cost pricing, we can do many other things, but we won't succeed. Hmm. A yeah. final uh, comment uh, then, uh, if, because we all aspire to become the most environmental uh, powerful person of the year, don't we, Matthias? <laughs> uh, I mean, this is such a, you know, 
If you would you know, become that next year, what would you have done by the end of this year? What would be your primary action that you would take and that next year would say that, okay, you know, you will be selected? What would be your own action? Uh, how, what, what I can do that can make me earn that title? Yes. yes. Um, a global TV series based on my novel that make people understand what's at stake. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Eva, what, what would you do? What, what, what would you have achieved? What I have achieved? What would you have achieved? Another microphone. <laughs> no, I think the most important thing is to be totally transparent what you want to do. If you are transparent what you want to do with your long-term long ambitions, what you want to achieve, then you also attract a lot of, of people that you can talk to, with and, and develop new ideas. And I think that's really necessary to be transparent. Instead of sitting on your own room, thinking on your own, you have to think together like this. That's why we work together with SAI for one year, and almost to, to discuss these very, very important and complex issues. So I think uh, this transparency, be totally open what you want to achieve, and then collect uh, the cleverest brains. The that's most what, clever brains. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that was a compliment for SAI. Ah, that's good. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not involved in the project, <laughs> as oh, you can you hear. Were there. Come on, I saw you. <laughs> Christina, you. what are you saying? Also, politicians are on this list. So. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think I would like to focus on the partnership with business, with the Swedish uh, business. And Swedish business is not only important for what we are doing in Sweden. It's important for what is happening in other countries, because we are so export-oriented. We are important in Africa. Ericsson, Scania, Volvo, ABB, they are all there, and they are important for what they are doing there. Back to your so question. partnership with business and strong partnership for, for uh, achieving the goals and uh, being not only national but Internet. cosmopolitan, international. Yeah, Matthias, I should also be a bit uh, honest about the fact that it's not actually you know, the most powerful environmental person, it's actually sustainability, so it's yeah. broader than that. So, so when, I was, when I was elected, that, uh, I think people verged between the disappointment and despair. <laughs> they, they thought, well, we are in trouble if that guy is the most powerful. That's how I felt too. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> we were up there together and people are super disappointed. But, but then after a while they realized, hey, if these guys can do it, anybody Anyone can. can. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and I, I think that's a really powerful message. And that also goes to Lena's question that I haven't answered until now. Uh, that that this, the sustainability goal number 17 is that in order to fix the other 16, we need to work much better together. I think mm -hmm. think tanks, policy, yeah. Jan contour it, the elephant moving out of the room and interaction and <laughs> b bakeries. I think we are doing something wonderful here together and that's by far the most important goal of those 17 for me. That's great. And you know, this was the final quote, and I gave it to you because you were still elected this year. Yeah. So even <laughs> then, that came before even a minister getting the final quote. Ooh, Christina, <laughs> if you don't have one. No, I'm fine. Oh, Take that's it. good. We <laughs> see like the wine that. from here, so we're all fine. No, but that's a perfect quote from <laughs> yeah. a politician. I'm fine. Then you know that you have succeeded. So far. Anyway, we have been running over time a little bit here, and you know, people got started to sense the smell from behind where there are stuff on the, on the bar counter there. Uh, so, we I want to give you a gift uh, mm -hmm. from SCI. It's actually very sustainable, to be honest. Uh, and uh, thank you very much with a very warm applaud. <laughs> thank you. Huh? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm and, I'm and, I'm and then I would like to hand it. over to uh, Rob. And what I would like to do, this is a bit of a coup also. This, this whole afternoon has actually been organized by Rob and his team from the communication uh, in SCI. It's an extraordinary sure, team of people. Can we give them an applaud as well, the whole team there? <laughs> um, so I get a chance, well actually I'm in a very dangerous position here because uh, I'm the one that's standing between you and refreshments. So I'm going to do three things. First of all, I'm going to say thank you. Then I'm going to tell you where you can get your refreshments. And then I'm going to say a couple of words just to round us all off. 
So first of all, I'm going to say thank you. And I'm going to say thank you to three groups of people. Uh, first of all, I, I, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all our speakers and panelists. And uh, also uh, thank you to your commitment, all your ideas that you shared with us. Um, it's uh, been an honor to work with you in SEI to develop your stories. And it's been great to hear from such a broad range of uh, inspirational speakers. So thank you to them, first of all. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank a few special people who, uh, without whom this couldn't have taken place. And I'm going to start by uh, saying thank you to Annelie Sundin. Uh, a very warm round of applause. Annelie did all of the organization for this. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Ian, who's standing over there. Uh, And also our webcast team, Avenue Product Corn. Thank you very much. And lastly, all of our helpers from Minchin Brigadier with all the refreshments. Very grateful to all of your support as well. And now you get a chance to applaud yourselves, because thank you the audience for coming and for your questions and for uh, showing your support to SEI and also to, uh, to the implementation of those sustainable development goals. Thank you for being here. I'm not going to tell you that the refreshments are going to be available. They are here behind you on the bar. They are also upstairs. And I can just see that the sun is trying to come through weekly through the clouds. And if you want to get a breath of fresh air, there's also some refreshments out in the sort of lobby area where you came in. So uh, you've got a chance to get a ground a, a bit of fresh air there as well. So just to, to, to finish off, I, I showed you a picture of the flea earlier on. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that through a lot of these presentations, you can see that details really do matter. And really what SEI has been able to present here is just a snapshot of all of our work. You can find some more about what we do from our publications displayed over uh, on the right-hand side here. You can go to our website. You can follow us on Twitter. Please do so. Um, and it's fair to say when you do that, you'll find that we aren't all just about the academic research. We're also about engaging with solutions. And I want to tell you a little very quick story about, about something that happened uh, yesterday, I think it was, um, where one of our researchers was presenting his work. It's on sustainable sanitation to colleagues at SEI. And he, he, he asked a question of the audience. And he said, you know, we know quite a lot about how to, how to close the circle on agriculture and reuse waste. How many many of you would be happy to eat food produced from human waste from your colleagues? 99% of people said they were. So, we're getting somewhere there. Um, I just wanted to also say that there's, there's one thing that came across to me during the course of today, which was the word equity coming up over and over again. And that's, that is social equity, it's gender equality, and of course it's about that goal to do with reducing inequalities. And the consequence of that is that we need to do things differently. And how do we do that? Well, we heard quite a lot about governance and institutions and finance. And in this case, I think we can say that coherence requires collaboration. And rules and goals for the short and medium term as well as for 2030 or 2050. But it also means maybe research needs to do it a bit differently as well. And I think that SAI is already starting that. It's starting to be more participatory, to co-produce knowledge with the users, to be close to things on the ground, to understand what those needs really are. And the other thing I think research needs to do is it needs to be able to say not only what is the situation now, provide all that anal analysis, but it also needs to describe what could be. Because it's through the description and the tension between what is and what could be that we can find stories that motivate change and that in the telling of those stories, we can have change that persists. Thank you very much. Please enjoy your refreshments.